January 11th um, organizational meeting of the Jefferson County Board of Education. We will start our meeting, first of all, with a moment of silence, please. Okay, thank you. We will now have the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, if you would like to stand, or, and we will be led by Dr. Polio, I assume. Okay, thank you, Dr. Polio. Um, next, we will have our vision statement this evening that will be read by board member Joe Marshall. Thank you, Chair Porter. All Jefferson County public school students graduate prepared, empowered, and inspired to reach their full potential and contribute as thoughtful, responsible citizens of our diverse shared world. Thank you so much. The next order of business is the organization of the board. Uh, the first meeting in January, this organizational meeting of the uh, Board of Education of the Jefferson County was convened in accordance with KRS 160.160, which requires boards of education to elect a chairperson and a vice chair person for the terms fixed by the board. Board policy 01.41 requires that this be done annually at the first regularly scheduled board meeting held in January. Therefore, the officers so elected serve a one year term or until their successors are elected and duly qualified. At, I will call for the nominations from the board for, for the board for chairperson to serve a one year term after all nominations for chairperson have been made, I will close the nominations. I will call for a vote on the candidate nominated. The votes will be taken in order in which the candidates were nominated. According to Robert's rules of order, if there are multiple nominees, as soon as one of the nominees receives the majority vote, four or more votes, the chair will declare that person elected to the office and no votes are to be taken on the remaining nominees from that office. The newly elected chairperson shall similarly conduct the election of the vice chairperson. So at this time, uh, I will call for nominations for the office of chairperson. Is there a nomination for board chairperson? I'm sorry. Dr. Yeah. Shull and then uh, Dr. Cove and then um, Ms. Duncan, if, if that takes care of it in that order. Mm -hmm. Am I to go first? I believe so. If, if you were not, um, I was not looking directly. So um, I think you were first. If that's not correct, does somebody I, want to correct me? I'd like to nominate Ms. Uh, Porter for chair. Okay, thank you. Are there other nominations for chair at this time? Dr. Chris? Nominate James Craig. James Craig. Okay, are there any other nominations? So at this time, I will call for a vote on the candidates nominated. Oh, wait a minute. Do we Wait a minute. Do we have to have a second on on the nominations? Kevin on Brown one? said we did not, but I will get, ask him to verify that, uh, Ms. Duncan, so everybody is clear. I ask him. So, Kevin, would you please verify that I'm doing right? Correct. You're correct. Okay. No second is required, Ms. Duncan. All right. Very good. Okay. Thank you. So we will now call for the vote in the order that the names were presented, starting first of all with. Board Member Porter, all those in favor of Board Member Porter, would you please raise your hand? Um, okay, Dr. Shaw, 
Dr. Marshall, Ms. Duncan, uh, Ms. McIntosh, and um, Diane Porter. Did I miss anybody? Okay, so at, the, at this point, there are, are five votes for Diane Porter, so that's more than the four that are required. So at this point, um, Diane Porter is declared the chair, um, and we will move forward, um, going forward. So, and again, uh, if I am making any mistakes, I would ask for Kevin Brown to speak up so there's no uh, after comments, I'd rather get it right the first time, as opposed to it being discussed after the fact. So if there's any, if there are questions you have, or if there's something that's not going right, I would request that uh, Kevin Brown, please speak up, please. Uh, you should call for those opposed, they can vote no, or they can uh, abstain. Okay, those voting no for Diane Porter, I need to call for that. Okay, so those voting no for Diane Porter are Chris Cobb and James Craig. So now we can move on to the next vote, correct? Correct, Robert's rules is clear in a, when you have more than one nominee, if the first nominee receives the uh, majority vote, uh, then you do not go to the uh, election for the, the second nominee. Okay, thank you. So at this time, I will call for nominations for the office of vice chair. Is there a nomination for the board vice chairperson. Board member Marshall and then board member Duncan. Board member Marshall. I'd like to nominate Dr. Corey Scholl to serve as vice chair. Okay, thank you. Are there other nominations for vice chair of the board? I hear no other nominations. So at this time, I'll call for the votes for uh, Dr. Corey Shull to be the vice chair of the board. All those in favor of Dr. Corey Shull, would you please raise your hand? Uh, let's see, Dr. Shull, Dr. Ms. Duncan, Ms. McIntosh, uh, Dr. Chris. Okay, Dr. Joe Marshall, thank you. Okay, those opposed to uh, Dr. Corshaw, James Craig. Okay, the vote has been decided uh, that Dr. Corshaw will, will serve as the vice chair of the board. So that takes care of the election of the chair and the vice chair as we move forward. Um, any questions before I move to the approval of the uh, meeting agenda? Any questions think, of Kevin Brown? About what to, we have just done. We, uh, only thing I would, I don't think we recorded your vote on the vice chair. Oh, I did. I just didn't say it out loud. Diane Porter. Right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now we will move forward with the recommendation for the approval of the meeting agenda. Um, I do have some comments to make about the election process. So do I say those till the end? Kevin, or do I get to do them now? Uh, up to the chair. Okay. Well, I don't know how long we're going to be here tonight, so let me read my comments. So, if I can find them. Hold on just a second. Okay. I'd like to start by thanking uh, District 1 for the opportunity to serve as their representative. I'm honored to currently represent the following neighborhoods in District 1, Algonquin, California, Chickasaw, Parkland, Park Duval, Park Hill, Portland, Russell, Shawnee, and Smoketown. I would like to thank Dr. Shull for serving as uh, the vice chair for your service and your support is appreciated. I would also like to thank the JCPS board for the opportunity to serve in leadership roles as to chair or vice chair. Thank you to our superintendent and all employees who work tirelessly to provide quality education, compassion and support for our students, staff and families before, during and after the pandemic. Life has many challenges, 
I'm sincerely grateful for everyone in my village who, for your caring thoughts, your guidance, and especially for your prayers. It's very obvious to me that I am not alone on this journey. Service on the board is work. As a board, we have accomplished much. There is, however, much to do. A few list of our accomplishments is the first I would like to start with is the corrective action plan that this uh, that the Board of Education voted on to allow us to remain in control of the school district within Jefferson County. Other com accomplishments, not a, the whole list, but uh, the resolution for males of color with the Council of Great City Schools, the racial equity plan, the opening of the W.E.B. Du Bois Academy and the Grace James Academy, increasing space to allow expansion of the Newcomer Academy, increased opportunity and increased enrollment for students in gifted and talented programs. Conversation, we, had, we started with the Council of Great City Schools for our board to have professional development work with them. The initial conversation was completed, but the scheduling time was not determined. So that, that is to be finished, that it started, but not finished. Current work for our board is school security, safety and health, student assignment, school start times, and the work to ensure going forward that we have equity with our school budget. Today, I attended the homegoing service for Daryl Owens, celebration of his life, love, and leadership. I mentioned his name because Daryl Owens was a graduate of Central High School. He graduated from Central State University, an HBCU, and then went on to earn his law degree at Howard University. I am inspired and pledged to keep the doors open that Daryl opened for us. His legacy and his work will continue. Daryl was the first and committed to every job that he had. While serving as president of the Louisville branch of the NAACP, a lawsuit was filed for desegregation of schools in Jefferson County. Thoughts that he left me and others with are fight for what is right and just. Segregation, discrimination, racism are not acceptable. One person can make a difference. Live your life with integrity. Push back the waters of injustice. We can and must save our children. Daryl Owens supported my work as a member of the board. He always answered my calls. That's very important for me. As I move forward with my work, I am encouraged by many. John Lewis said, when you see something that is not right and not fair, not just, you have to say something, you have to do something and continue to make good trouble. We're getting ready to celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King. From him, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. We must be the voice for those who are afraid or uncomfortable to share their concerns. I will always speak for equity, access, and opportunity for our children. It is important for me to be at the table. Every seat that is available matters. I will continue to use my voice. Moving forward, I will get direction this month from my constituents as to where I need to be at the table. I will then consult with Kevin Brown as we move forward. I am blessed to say that for such a time as this, God has put me here to make a difference. I thank God and I thank you for this opportunity. So moving on, um, is there a recommendation for the approval of the meeting agenda? Uh, recommendation by board member Marshall, seconded by board member Duncan. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Okay, it's unanimous, thank you. Uh, the next is the recommendation for the approval of minutes of, previous min of the previous meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the December 14th meeting? Board member Marshall, seconded by board member McIntosh. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, it's unanimous, thank you. At this time, it is my honor to introduce to you for the superintendent's report, Dr. Marty Polio. Dr. Polio, 
Thank you, Chair Porter and board members. I bring you the superintendent report for January 11th. Um, and I will be brief in my superintendent report today because I know we have three important agenda items this evening, uh, information items that we will be discussing. So first, we would usually have the opportunity to do this in person, but since we are virtual, we're not having the op uh, chance to recognize our board members uh, for school board appreciation month here in January. But I did want to take a second to recognize all seven of you. Um, all seven of you give a great deal of your own lives to the students, employees, and families of JCPS. And despite your own jobs and all other responsibilities, each of you do this very difficult work because you care so much about public education. And you do all of this for very little, if any, compensation in the end. And despite the challenges and sometimes disagreements, you know, I've never been more confident in a group of people who provide service to the public school community because you care so much about JCPS and the children of this community. I also am looking forward to working with you in 2022. You know, we began the year uh, in the face of the Omicron variant spreading throughout our community, making uh, holding school challenging on a daily basis. We'll be talking about that in one of our information sessions later, so I'll save information about that. And we know we're gonna have to continue to make difficult decisions to support students, schools, employees, and families throughout 2022. However, we are also beginning an unprecedented year of potential change in the district. As you know, we'll be tackling major issues in the months to come like student assignments, school safety, school start times, and other critical future uh, state changes um, that I look forward to talking about and discussing with you. But I do wanna say through all these challenges, I look forward to working with each of you. And I thank all seven of you for your service to the students and staff of JCPS. And finally, I do want to take a moment, and this is kind of sad for us, but I would like to take a moment to recognize Renee Murphy. Uh, and I hate to say this, but tonight will be her last board meeting with us. I'm not surprised that she has been taken from us and recruited such a, as such a prestigious position in Norton Healthcare. I told Russ Cox that I'm not happy with him at all for, for this. Um, it pains me to lose her from the team but I have to say we're all very proud of her here at JCPS. Her work ethic, knowledge, energy, enthusiasm, and commitment to the team in JCPS is second to none. And I can say personally, she has been a colleague, confidant, advisor, and friend to me over the past several years. She has guided the communications and public relations of JCPS during quite possibly the most difficult times in public school history. More than that, she has put up with me. Um, which is not easy to be this close and have to put up with me over three years, but she has done it, incredible job. And so Renee, I think I speak for everyone on our board and everyone in JCPS, you will be missed greatly. Thank you, Ms. Porter. Thank you, Dr. Polio. And um, because we can't reach through the screen and actually hug and applaud uh, Renee as a board, I would ask that the board just clap so everybody, so Renee can see that to thank her for the work that she has done and to wish her well as she moves forward. And I will say to Renee, please answer our call if we ever call you, please, ma'am. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Uh, we do not have- Crying a little, which I haven't seen before. I'm sorry? She's crying a little bit, which I haven't seen before. Well, I'm not gonna put her on the spot, leave her alone, okay? She deserves to cry, <laughs> that's what she wants to do. So um, as we, as it pertains to speakers for the board tonight, we do not have that. So there is a new email for people that want to send their uh, comments to the board, board comments at jefferson.ky.us, kyschools.us. So we did receive several uh, emails prior to this meeting. Uh, there, we will be moving forward uh, as we move forward to determine what our speakers will look like going forward. Uh, the next item on the agenda are action items, and there are none for this evening. So we now move into the information sessions that we have today, and there are three information sessions, and the first one is uh, safety and information. And I would ask Dr. Polio, um, there are some concerns about us receiving the additional information at 4.30 yesterday, could we please as a board receive the information and have a little bit more notice to go through the things that we're gonna discuss the next day. So I would ask that 
on behalf of the board, if everybody's happy with getting it at 430, you can say so. But I think that for those that work, it's a little difficult to receive the information at 430 prior to a board meeting the next day. Having said that, Dr. Polio, would you move us forward with safety and safety information, please? Yes, ma'am. Um, we will start uh, board members discussing um, our first time, and this is really to get input. We've been working on input. So once again, this is a first opportunity to see and respond us to make changes and bring back to you um, later on for a possible recommendation. But, but this is for your input at this time. And obviously school safety officers has been one of the most contentious issues that I have had to deal with in my time, um, you know, going back to being acting superintendent and throughout the entire time here in JCPS. So the better part of four and a half years now, it's been a very contentious issue and it continues to be a very contentious issue nationally um, as we wrestle with this. I was encouraged uh, many months ago to um, look for a way that, um, you know, we could provide additional safety for our schools and students and, and staff, while at the same time making sure we're being supportive of our students as well um, and looking at it from an equity lens. So that's what we are really working on, been working on doing is providing an innovative approach uh, to school safety. And um, this is uh, what we would like to bring you to discuss today as a potential solution in JCPS. So first of all, our, our purpose of this session is to provide a summary of a potential new safety proposal. Once again, get feedback from you. We have been working on feedback so far um, this week with others, uh, role groups in the community to get feedback on this, including students, my superintendent advisory council, which I have to say gave me some fantastic feedback. I spent about, oh, about an hour and a half with, with our students um, so we continue to get feedback. We will continue to do that before bringing you um, any final proposal. So first and foremost, we wanna talk about currently what are in schools. Um, so as you can see, we added mental health professionals and counselors in schools to support mental health. I would put our numbers up, you know, that um, against any other school, when we talk at school district, we talk about the number of counselors that we provide to students when we added a mental health professional to every school, which this board approved, uh, I believe two years ago was what we approved that. I'm very proud of that work. We also have in-school security monitors. Uh, those are classified staff members in each middle and high school. Every middle and high school has at least one in-school security monitors. Most of our high schools have multiple in-school security monitors. And then we have them in many of our elementary schools and moving to having them in, in all elementary schools in the near future. We've been working on building improvements, cameras at front doors, locking classroom doors, uh, improved entryways, those type of things to improve security. And to support schools, you know, we, we increased our district security department, including our district security monitors um, uh, last year to, to make sure that we support our schools. And then these are the positions you have recently added. Four mental health professionals to support gun-involved youth youth experiencing trauma due to violence and youth or victims of youth threatening violence. And you approved that at our last board meeting and moving forward to support our students and staff in that way. You approved a court liaison who will serve support and respond to students who are court involved and a specialist for violence prevention who promotes health and wellness by coordinating with community partners. Um, so we are really working hard to in the prevention model um, of school safety and security. I did wanna talk a little bit about the history of SROs where we were, especially at the year 2018-19, which was the last year that we had SROs in JCPS. At that time, we had 28 schools that had an SRO assigned inside the building for the entire day. And I wanna make sure we understand the numbers and know what those numbers. So we had 28 officers, 17 were LMPD, eight were sheriff's office, two were J-Town Police Department, and one was the St. Matthews Police Department. In, 2000, in July of 2019, LMPD notified us that they would be removing the 17 LMPD officers because of budget cuts and staff shortages. So they would be removing those and ending the JCPS contract with LMPD. So that took us down to 17. 
St. Matthew's also did the same thing prior to a board vote. So that was removed. So at the time, JCPS board made the decision not to renew contracts. That was with the sheriff's office and J-Town Police Department. And so that was a total of 10. We had 10 SROs that would have been in schools for the 2018-19 school year. Um, and so I think it's important that we note that um, with those numbers, I don't think LMPD has improved um, in the amount of officers they would be able to provide. My guess is they have more vacancies now than they did at that time. And so, you know, the, the older model of partnering with a police agency is, is untenable for SROs, especially when we're looking at 155 schools. That's not a possibility when we are talking about any old model with contracting with an outside agency, because as, uh, as of 1819, we had 10 was the total that we had. So overview of our concept that we are talking about. So as you know, going into uh, before the pandemic, we were working on our own uh, school safety officer, and we would like to bring that back to you, a school safety officer. Um, but really, if we start on the right side, so let's talk about the school safety officer. You know, those, those um, officers would patrol approximately three to seven schools in a geographic zone. So they would be located in that geographic zone. They would be outside of the school, but they would also be able to respond quickly when needed uh, for support at the school. They would serve a set of schools. They would have an SSO assigned to the school, uh, but they would once again be outside of the school. They would be an armed sworn law enforcement officer. We currently already have uh, about 20 on staff. We would have to have additional training for them, obviously, to meet that need, but we would hire about 10 more uh, to make sure that we could, uh, the geographic zones would be covered in all areas. They would partner with the safety administrator, which I'll talk about in just a second, uh, who the safety administrator could reach out to the S SSO for support and they report to the security and investigations department. So that would be the SSO that um, would be meeting the law about providing an SSO for each school. Inside the school would be the safety administrator. And we want uh, to highlight this. We think this is an innovative approach to serving schools and supporting schools. They would manage all safety related issues in the school. They would have no other responsibilities um, that a normal administrator would have from evaluating print, uh, teachers to managing buses, cafeteria duty, all the things that an administrator would do, their entire focus would be on safety related issues. Their focus and core would be around building relationships with students, getting to know students, being the support in the building. They definitely would assist with multiple aspects of school safety procedures that are the things uh, that are very difficult for schools right now to deal with. Um, so for instance, um, social media threats, this would be a person who would be able to respond immediately to social media threats. They would, um, and to investigate threat assessments when a student needs a threat assessment. If students need to speak to someone about some potential information about an incident in the school or in the community, this is who they would go to. And I will say this, out my uh, principal advisory group, the student advisory, they wanted to make sure we had a way that students could report things to the safety administrator on weekends or after school in a very um, efficient way. And I thought that was excellent feedback from them and even provide information if necessary about other schools that they might hear about. And so making sure our safety administrators have the ability to communicate across school lines. These would be assigned to every middle and high school as we begin this process. So the purpose, I just go through real quick, the difference in the two, I wanna highlight these. Purpose of school safety officers. Those are the sworn officers that are to protect and maintain the, the safety of students and staff. You know, they're gonna work with district staff, community partners. Their job is going to be respond immediately to crimes and emergencies. You know, they're gonna have that proper training and certification to serve as armed sworn law enforcement officers. And they will be in the general vicinity 
geographically of the school to respond when its school administration calls at the request of the principal. Once again, I'll highlight this is not responsible for student discipline, you know, and they are outside of the school. Now they're going to serve a group of high schools in a geographic area that aligns with a high school so that they can have quick response times. They'll patrol their assigned schools and be ready to respond to any who need help. The SSOs will be primarily in their cars in order to respond quickly to a school that needs them. So as you could see, an example, one example of the assignment in a geographic area, Ballard would be the high school that it would be closest to, but this uh, school safety officer would also support camera or middle school, and then several elementaries close by in the area as well, like Wilder Elementary, Norton Elementary, that may be some of the schools that they serve. So they would geographically support those schools. The purpose of the safety administrator, although they will uh, communicate often, is going to be to really foster positive school culture and climate. As I said, they're really building those relationships of trust with students and employees, maintaining positive relationship with school stakeholders. So bringing out, you know, they could be working to bring outside organizations to come in and support students as well. But they're really going to assist with all aspects of that school safety, the threat assessments, the threat monitoring, social media, um, anything that, you know, the drills that are responsible for, those type of things. But once again, this, this safety administrator is not responsible for student discipline. They are responsible for 100% of the time uh, focusing on that safety, building trust with students so that we can ensure that model of safety inside of our schools. So, <clears throat> excuse me, both positions um, were responsible to support students. And so as their first duties, as we hire these on your approval um, and begin as quickly as possible, we want the training to be substantial and to spend um, several months, if possible, training to be prepared, training in mental health services, training in substance abuse assessment and treatment providers, knowing child protective services and what to look for, shelters that families may need, domestic violence services, family counseling agencies, all of those ways. I also see obviously the, um, the safety administrator being very close with the Frisky in our middle and high schools to, to be able to support students in ways that they might need that. This is a list of training, JCPS training for school safety officers and the safety administrator. We're gonna require around 60 hours annually. I won't read the whole list, but you can see some of the training that we will require of them, you know, um, cross-cultural communication, de-escalation, restorative practices, trauma-informed care. They would be safe crisis management trained. Um, IDEA, so ECE support, special education supports. They would know the student support and behavior handbook, bullying resource, so they could step in and bully in situations to support students, you know, new employee training. Um, and any other training that we may need. And then our SSOs under Senate Bill 1 will require 40 annual, uh, additional 40 hours annually, state mandated training for school resource officers and the POPs certification that they would all need. Just a little bit, we have over the course of the past several years studied many other districts. Um, we've looked at some for some innovative approaches. Um, we think this could be the most innovative approach that we have seen. Um, several other districts have worked on having a similar safety administrator inside of the school building, but not with the type of training that we would like to provide ours. So we have looked at many other districts. We've been getting feedback on the proposal. Um, as you can see, um, as we've talked through this, these are some of the things that people have said, want to maintain positive relationships, build positive relationships, aspects of all safety. Um, and the same with the school safety officers, you can see as we've talked about some of that feedback. You know, and I did want to share some of the focus groups, the people that we have met with at this point shared the proposal like we're doing with you, answered question, received feedback. We're going to continue to do that, but that's everyone from Urban League, NAACP, La Casita, the PTA, LMPD, ACLU, my student advisory council that I told you about, Metro Louisville. Uh, and several others. So I think it's important to know that we are having ongoing conversations to make sure 
uh, that we do this the right way, and that's going to be the most important part of this. And so our next steps, as you can see, we are going to have a virtual town hall tomorrow, so anyone who wants to give us input can provide uh, information. That's the next step on feedback. Um, we are obviously, we have to deal with some policy things. Um, if we are going to do that, I just want to let you know to approve this. And moving forward, it would require uh, some policy changes that we talked about specifically for our SSOs, and we've already worked on that um, prior to COVID in our policy meeting, so we're very close in being able to, able to move forward on those. Then it would require you all to approve some job descriptions uh, for the new uh, safety administrator and the SSOs that we would have. Um, this is just a first shot if we feel comfortable at that time around January 26th, having a proposed meeting to consider that organizational chart and job descriptions. And then we want to make sure you have a clear picture in that time of the budget, what that would cost, and any policy changes that we need to make as a result of that. And then after approval, we would begin the hiring process and begin training to get going as soon as we can. Obviously, the vast majority of the training would be happening in the summer months, which would begin implementation around the first day of school in August um, for this new process. So um, I believe that concludes um, our presentation. Um, that's our first go at it again. We'd like to hear your feedback, see what you like, see what you would like to see changed um, before we bring a second report back to you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Um, board members will have an opportunity now to either give their thoughts or to ask questions. Um, we're gonna set the timer for five minutes. If you ask a question and it takes four minutes to answer the question, then we'll give you another five minutes, but we're trying to move this as quickly as possible for questions and comments as we go forward. So um, starting with, I'd like to start with uh, board member McIntosh. Questions or comments, please. Chair Porter. Um, okay, well, there's a lot. Um, I'll go really quickly and, and maybe I don't necessarily need responses right now. Some of these are just kind of, I think, big picture, long-term questions as well as short-term. Um, I'm sure that the initial cost will probably be more um, like in the first year than maybe in the subsequent years because of the training that will be required. Um, so if the next time we get together um, on this, if we can get kind of a comprehensive overview of what the initial cost will be and then what we expect the cost to be um, for each subsequent budget year, because I'm sure we'll have to retrain and ongoing and all that kind of thing. So that would be one thing. Um, another thing is um, just in general, would we be looking to um, pay for and provide training for them to become sworn officers or would we target our hiring to um, existing law enforcement, retirees, um, those folks who have maybe already had that law enforcement background? For which position are you referring to the SSO position? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, the SSO position. Uh, yes, it could be both. I mean, obviously, okay. existing law enforcement officers reduce the need for uh, lengthier training. Um, we still would have to provide the training for us for the, um, the required SSO, but that 40 hours. Uh, but we would be looking to both. Okay. Um, I think one additional question, and, and this is maybe in the weeds a little bit, so it may not be fleshed out yet. When we talk about them patrolling um, the areas, are we looking at having um, them also patrolling neighborhoods and things like that around bus pickups and dismissal times as well? Or are we, I guess, what are the hours that we're looking at these positions to fill? So I think that's the benefit of this. Um, obviously the safety administrator would be one that may be getting information inside of a school that they would wanna be, provide that could happen outside in a community. But as a bus stop, yes, then we could send the school safety officer to the bus stop 
uh, have a direct conversation with, if necessary, LMPD. Um, and so, you know, those conversations would be had between the safety administrator, the SSO. The SSOs would be working and cover the bus stops. Um, and, you know, if it's not a JCPS issue, but it could be a community issue, uh, much better communication between our security and uh, that which may be necessary in the community with LMPD or another police agency. Okay, and then my, my last comment, um, because I, I don't think this is something that we can really answer at this moment. Um, when Louisville Metro had to vote to close JCYC, uh, that took effect, what, January 1st of 2020, um, through my reading and research and communication with folks, I've, I've learned that um, closing JCYC was largely a result of the state not providing funding, even though the juvenile justice system is a state responsibility. So what I wanna make sure that we're doing is if we have a student who unfortunately does need to be detained um, or held for whatever, whatever reason, that we also have a proper uh, procedure and process where we're um, collaborating with existing law enforcement and juvenile justice systems to make sure that that student is adequately processed, um, but also connected to appropriate services. So um, that sounds like something that maybe we would have to work with, with the state on or to figure out if they're going to ever properly fund the juvenile justice system. And I know I'm getting a little bit off um, topic, but I think that um, this is all part of a bigger issue, and I'm, I'm glad to see that we're working on it, but I think it's something that we can't resolve alone, and we have to make sure that, um, you know, if we have a student who, unfortunately, again, makes some bad decisions and finds himself in some kind of way where they are going to enter the juvenile justice system, that we're not just um, taking them into custody talking to them, telling them what they've done wrong, and then turning them right back out into the streets um, to theirs and others detriment. So I don't know what that'll look like, um, but I'd like to see some information around that and maybe see what we can do to reach out to our state and local partners on that. Okay, um, yeah, it's, uh, I can't say, I can't speak to exactly where it is at the state level or the city level, so I'm not, I'm not aware of that. I can say that you know, the additional safety measures we will put in place will assist greatly in communication. Um, I also believe that who, the positions you approved last time will be in a line with this also mm -hmm. to support and help um, any student who might be in that juvenile justice system. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Next, uh, Dr. Shull, and then after Dr. Shull, uh, Linda Duncan. All right, thank you, Chair Porter. I have a few questions that um, I would like to raise first. Um, how are we ensuring that equity is embedded into this proposal as it relates to assigning uh, security administrators? Um, for instance, there are some schools that, for instance, like the high school in District 6, one of the high schools in District 6 may need more uh, security administrators um, than just one. So how are we ensuring that we're ensuring that equity is embedded into this plan? Yeah, that's a great question, Dr. Shul, and it's a question we got in one of our feedback sessions that made us consider, um, you know, our first, admittedly, our first was one per school, but I think we're going to have to take a look at that um, as we begin to look at school assignment and, and base it on equity, um, you know, and once again, we need to make sure it's about support, uh, but I, I agree with you. I think that was great feedback that we got before, and it's caused us to take a look at the assignment and how we might have to bring either additional spots for certain schools to you um, or look at some ways uh, you know, we really don't want to share them per school, but I think some additional spots in uh, large schools that need additional support is warranted. Thank you. Do uh, SSOs have arrest power? Uh, yes, they would. Yes. Okay. Uh, has consideration been given to adjustments or exceptions to this plan needed for alternative schools? Uh, yes, we would be looking potentially um, 
whether that would be a single SSO for an alternative school or a greatly reduced number of, of schools that that uh, SSO would have. We think we need additional support at our um, special schools. When will that be included in the plan? We will bring you next time some um, specifics about the geographic areas. You know, we wanted conceptually to hear your plan, but we will bring you some the maps, geographic areas, and the specific schools that would be aligned with each SSO. Oh, okay. but, but I guess I'm asking, when will we uh, have a have a portion of this proposal that specifically speaks to alternative schools? Before our next meeting. Okay. You will Thank have you. that list next time. Okay. Um, what procedures will be put into place to ensure that um, security administrators are not being used for disciplinary action uh, with students? Yeah, I think what we are going to have to do um, is to, um, you know, it is very similar in a different way, but to our um, uh, implementation coaches for ECE that we have one in every school. Um, or our mental health professionals that we design a system where they report immediately to um, someone in central office whose job is to monitor that consistently and daily and make sure uh, that um, schools with random, it can be visits to schools, feedback from the administrators, but to make sure they are not doing discipline or other duties that take them away from focusing on school safety. So that will be a part of the design that we bring you because that, that is probably the most important part of this is to ensure um, fidelity to um, that which of uh, um, focusing on safety alone. What about, have we thought about including uh, drug rehabilitation in the list of things that uh, the security administrators help us to achieve? I saw the uh, listing of other things that they will provide. Uh, I'm concerned about students who self-medicate and who act out as a consequence of that. And so I would like to see us include some of that into the plan. If I think that's a great, great, great feedback. Thank you. And then lastly, I'm hearing from elementary schools who feel that they need uh, some help, maybe through uh, a security administrator. Is that something that you're looking to put into this plan? I think we could discuss that. I mean, you know, looking at uh, the need first, obviously we went with middle and high. So, you know, if that is what the board wants, um, you know, I think it would be difficult for us, even staffing wise, um, to do all elementary schools. We would be talking 90 more on top of that. Um, but, you know, and so we wanna make sure we, if, if we look at elementary schools, we do it equ equitably. Um, but we are open to that and open to growing it as we are successful with it. I think it's important to look at our needy elementary schools, our high risk elementary schools, our, our, our elementary schools who are asking for that type of assistance. Uh, some of them do not want to be left out of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shull. Uh, Ms. Duncan, and after Ms. Duncan will be Joe Marshall and then James Craig. Ms. Duncan. Oh. Did I undo my, am I unmuted? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. All right. Oh, uh, Dr. Polio, have you made sure that this uh, will be acceptable to the legislature because it does not follow the law? Um, the intent is to, to serve the schools, but again, we're leaving out the elementaries. So um, what do you think, um, this reception will be with the legislature and the law? Well, I think, you know, the law, um, as we look at it, and I do want to say this, that um, in the Senate Bill 1, it said local boards of education, school superintendents, uh, and agencies shall cooperate to assign one or more SROs to each school within a district as district funds and qualified persons become available. Uh, so we will be assigning one to each school. Um, we will have one to each school, even in elementary. Uh, the SSO will be assigned to that school. Um, now, I, I do think that any district in this state, if we look at it and say personnel become available, it is going to be impossible to add another 600 law enforcement agents uh, to 600 schools across this state right now, much less 155 
for us. So we will be assigning one to every school. Uh, they just may have several schools that they will be serving, which is similar to other districts in this state that do that as well. So, you know, I do, I do want to, you know, say that Fayette County, for instance, those SSOs have several schools that they are responsible for. Uh, in regards to, I can't say exactly what um, our um, legislators will do. I know I've spoken to, so we've spoken to several of them locally. They seem to be supportive of it, but um, you know, I can't speak for them, but I do think it is the right way moving forward for us. Um, I, I have a variety of questions that come from, from different things, so it kind of jumps around. Um, one of the things I, I want you to explain is what do we mean? What, what does equitably reducing school-based arrests mean? What does that mean? Equitably reducing. I mean, it's, it sounds like if we're, if we're equitably reducing arrests, we're going to be looking at percentages and making sure everybody is in alignment with the percent of the students that they serve. Is, is that what it means? Or, or is there some other meaning that we're supposed to attach to this? Well, my belief would be that um, we ensure uh, that no student is arrested or cited for a school discipline issue that, you know, that it may, may lead to a citation or an arrest in one school, but not in another if there is not an SSO in that school. So I think, you know, when I see it and talk about it, it is ensuring that school discipline is school discipline and legal issues remain legal issues and not crossing those two paths. Well, I know our, our discipline code handles so much uh, that, that we don't need law enforcement. We didn't need law enforcement for years and years and it had handled so much uh, that way. But um, of course, we don't have the alternative school support that I think we used to have at that point where we could, we could uh, assign kids for uh, some of these offenses. I want to ask about uh, response time. What are we, what are we thinking the, res the response time will be when our officers are not in the buildings and they're called to buildings? What are we, what are we trying to aim for here? Because uh, we don't have much time in some uh, very serious situations. Well, I think that's the purpose of the geographic. I can't say specifically what that time would be. Obviously, that is dependent on which geographic area and some outside factors. But our goal would be that the safety administrator and principal would have um, immediate contact with that SSO, such as a radio, uh, that they could contact them immediately. Um, and that SSO could be there as quickly as they could possibly get there, which I believe would be within minutes. What happens if schools, two schools, need officers at the same time in the same zone? Um, I, I know that's an operational kind of thing, but, but what are we thinking? How will that generally be handled if two schools uh, within the same zone need officers? I think they would, we would use um, the other um, SSOs from another geographic area would be called over to support. Uh, which I think if, in the need of emergency would, would easily be able to do. Okay, that's, that's just an important consideration for everybody. In terms of the safety administrators, um, qualifications, what are you thinking going to be qualifications for these, these people? Right now we're looking at bachelor's degree. Um, we are, you know, so it's not required to be law enforcement. They could be that. They're not required to be educators, so we're not necessarily requiring a certified person that is an educator. Um, you know, they could be a classified administrator. So for instance, you know, Friskies right now are classified administrators. They don't have to have a teaching certification. And so what we are looking for um, as we hire are gonna be those um, people that we believe have the right qualifications, the bachelor's degree, but also have the ability to connect with kids, build relationships with students, have trusted relationships with students in a school building, you know, and, and obviously work extremely hard. So there'll be a variety of opportunities, but this will be an administrator 
uh, who will have to have, you know, the qualifications and education necessary. Okay. Um, what about how this individual is going to have opportunities to interact with kids? What do you What do you envision that being? Uh, how they will have an opportunity because they're not going to be called to the situations that our our usual security monitors are called to. Um, so so how will will they be able to interact with kids so kids can can learn who they are and and learn that they can trust these people? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I want to say, first of all, they would be expected to respond to a crisis situation um, inside of a school. I mean, that is their responsibility. That's why we would have them safe crisis management trained. Uh, but they are not going to be in school security monitors. Uh, but they, they are going to be trained to respond to those when needed. But I see this person as being somebody who would be in um, consistently in the hallways, the cafeteria, the entrance to school, the exit to school, uh, you know, even stopping by classrooms, maybe speaking to classes, building relationships. I mean, I think this is going to be an active, this is not an office position. You know, now they will have that to have conversations when needed in privacy. But I do see this as being a very active person who is consistently interacting with kids. Um, I know it's it's going to be difficult to separate uh, separate their roles here. Um, and I think a lot of people uh, in schools are going to want to know if they can step in and help in situations what they'll be allowed to step in and help in, help in situations on. And, and I think all that needs to be very clearly spelled out for everyone. So people won't be asking them to do things that they're not supposed to do, or they won't be uh, moving into things maybe that are, are better held by, are better uh, taken on by other individuals in the school. Um, you know, uh, in this conversation with uh, I always worry about guns, and of course, this person will not be able to to do anything other than anyone else can do if uh, somebody starts uh, shooting a, a firearm in a building. Um, but I, I do think uh, it's important that they that, that there be somebody there who can uh, help control a situation like that, or at least people can look to to control until our officer gets there. So, uh, you know, I'll, I don't know. I think uh, sometimes I think uh, their training should in include uh, enough to allow them to be able to, to help in controlling a situation. Otherwise, they're not going to be looked on as, um, as the people who can, can actually stop things from happening or can, uh, you know, be a part of that that process, they're going to be kind of an outsider on those things. So I don't know. I, I, I have to think about this. I know uh, one thing I would, <laughs> I wish we could do. I wish we could ban backpacks in our buildings um, as they move through the hallways and, um, you know, students move through the hallways uh, with their backpacks. I, I wish there were some way we could come up with other ways of, uh, dealing with the weapons that we're finding because where are we finding them? We're finding them in backpacks. And it just seems like we've got to start thinking about other ways to intercept these, these weapons. What, what will be, what is something we can do to discourage the bringing in of these weapons? But that's a, that's it. Thank you for right now. I, lots of questions, but, but for right now, that's all I'll ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Uh, next will be Joe Marshall, and after Joe Marshall will be James Craig. After James Craig will be uh, Dr. Chris. Uh, thank you, Chair Porter. I'm gonna, um, for the sake of time, send my major questions through email to get those answered. Uh, but I do have some few short comments. Uh, first, I want to ditto and second the point made by Board Member Duncan and Board Member Scholl about elementary schools. Um, as an elementary educator myself, I understand the importance of starting early 
So I like all the work that we're doing around safety and mental health professionals. Um, so as we continue to do this work, uh, I, for one, would like to see an increased focus on our elementary schools and what supports we're giving there uh, in regards to mental health, uh, gun violence, um, also uh, alternative schools as well. Uh, there is one in my district also. Um, I think that one thing about our alternative programs is they are alternative programs for a reason. And so we shouldn't operate them the same as we do uh, in other buildings. So I would like to see you know, a focus on how we're going to support uh, those special programs in a way that fits their building and their system. And then also um, continue to look into our restorative justice practices and our trainings that are being offered. I know uh, restorative justice uh, is an amazing uh, way to deal with students um, that provide so much more equity in buildings. Uh, but I would like to see us continue to look into how we are training when information is being offered. You know, before we put officers into a program to train in this, uh, I for one would like to see um, what that looks like and what that training program is and how effective it is in really changing systems and buildings. And then lastly, um, I think that our policy on this, I know we've done some work and had some conversation uh, pre-pandemic, um, but I once again like to see us comb through that policy uh, before these positions are offered with a fine-tooth comb, fine tooth comb to make sure uh, that before we hire and put anyone in a building that it is 100% clear uh, what that person's responsibilities are what they are to be utilized for, uh, and how it best serves students. So those are all the comments I have, and I'll send the rest of my questions through email. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Board Member Marshall. Uh, Board Member Craig. Um, following up on the point that Mr. Marshall was making at the end of his comments, a lot of this work was already done, wasn't it, Marty? I have the minutes from the February 18th, 2020 Policy Committee in front of me. Um, four of us were at that meeting, followed up on the February 6th policy committee meeting where six of us were at the meeting, everybody present tonight, uh, except for Sarah McIntosh. There was consensus coming out of those two policy committee meetings that we held right before the pandemic began that the policies and procedures and the standard operating procedures for the SSOs would be brought to the full board for consideration. And I'm not sure that we've ever, I've had a chance to speak on these publicly recently, and um, those policies and procedures have formed the basis for many of my conversations with legislators and others in the district that I represent. Um, I don't know that we have ever articulated to the community why after six months of work um, at the policy committee meeting and after spending such an exorbitant sum on a contract for a consultant to come in for nearly a year, to work us through that process, why those policies and procedures um, never made their way from policy to this board. Um, Dr. Polio, can you help me <laughs> answer that question for the folks that I'm speaking to? Why don't we have those in front of us tonight? Well, I think the answer to that is February 2020 was uh, what we said was three or four weeks before COVID you know, hit and we were in NTI then for the better part of a year at that point. And obviously the challenges that we faced at that time. And so, um, you know, we are using those policies as a basis now that we would bring to you. Obviously it's gonna be a little different, a lot different specifically in the role that we would be asking, uh, but those policies and, and SOPs will be very similar. Uh, so we're starting from that point, we'll use that work to bring to you those um, as, as we move into the policy committee. There's a, I see about 15 pages of single type spaced um, notes uh, on policies and procedures from those meetings, much denser and much more thorough than just the PowerPoint that we're seeing tonight. So hopefully all that work isn't lost. It's not, we have it. Um, I echo the comments that uh, earlier were said about elementary schools. Although I think I disagree about um, beginning with the high need schools. 
the point that Dr. Scholl made. Uh, I think the, the threats that the SSOs are supposed to address and alleviate are not necessarily you know, student-based threats, especially in the elementary context, but threats from outside. For example, there are many elementary schools in my district um, that you know, parents are engaged in custody fights and the involvement of law enforcement is sometimes unfortunately needed. Um, those can happen in any school, not just a high need school. So I think we need to be able to answer the question of what we're gonna do for elementary schools throughout uh, the entirety of the district. Uh, the next point, how many um, of these SSOs do you anticipate hiring? We have about 22 high schools and 21 middle schools, is that right? Yes, that's approximate, yes. So how many do, would you anticipate that we're going to hire? Uh, we'll bring you the exact number, but we're estimating about 30. Okay. Total. And we already uh, have, as you know, um, I don't know what the official number is as today, but I know we have 20 positions that are approved as of today. Thank you. Um, you anticipate that we'll be able to take a vote on this at our next meeting? Um, we would probably want this to be a specially called meeting if the board, if the chair and vice chair agree with that. Uh, and you're anticipating that at the end of January? If we feel that, yes, the board is ready to, you know, uh, if we are going to have it by the first day of school in August, obviously we'll need to begin hiring and training um, the training will have to be substantially in the summertime, um, but as we know, the clock's ticking and we've got to get going on hiring so that we can train. So, um, you know, I'm not saying it definitely has to be at the end of January, but we definitely will need to move. This is why this is kind of first on our agenda because it, it's the most time pressing right now. Thank you. Uh, do you think that it could be implemented in any small portion for the balance of this academic year? or is the earliest that we could implement it would be August of 2022? I think our SSOs, we could implement that. I mean, the safety administrators were designed, we still have to design the training, the SSOs. Um, we could implement parts of that uh, prior to the end of the year for those that are already officers and trained. All right, thank you. I, I had come to support the, the policy that we had worked on in February of 2020, and I can support this one too, but, um, I've said this in other contexts and I'll say it here this evening. I think we need to do this or this problem is going to be solved for, for us. And I think it is better for this board to do it itself than to be told by some other committee in Frankfurt uh, what to do. So I hope we can move forward with this with some haste. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chris. Thank you. Um, First, I just want to say that if for anybody to say or imply that this proposal does not follow the law, whether they say it in a board meeting, in the media, or in the state legislature, but state legislature is just absolutely false and deliberately misleading. Um, this proposal absolutely follows the law. Um, we don't get to choose, you know, the law is passed. We don't get to choose what the law says. It says what it says, and there's absolutely no question that this proposal follows the law. Um, the uh, first question I had, Dr. Polio, how did we land on for the um, for the school safety safety officer SSO? How did we land on three to seven, you know, schools per officer, a total of about thirty officers? Um, we took a look geographically at the city, um, and and really with one hundred and fifty five schools and. You know, we felt that every officer should have it really, it won't be exactly this when we put in maybe some alternative schools, but we were looking at one middle school, excuse me, one high school, one middle school, and then, the, you know, depending on location, uh, three, four, five elementary schools. Um, so looking at it geographically, that's how we landed on that. So uh, we have about 20 of these folks already. We'd be looking to hire about 10 more. Um, so I guess, okay, so I see what you're saying. So it's less a matter of schools per officer as much as it is the location and kind of compactness. And, you know, if there's seven schools within a certain area, there may only be five schools in a similar area somewhere else. Is that correct? 
That's correct. I mean, we once again, we want it to be so that they can respond quickly. So it will also depend on uh, distance between schools. Gotcha. Um, the, uh, so uh, I think Ms. McIntosh mentioned, that, mentioned this, but you know, saying one of the main things I'll be, of course, very interested to see is the price tag um, of this, you know, in some ways, um, in some ways, it looks like what we're describing as SSOs is already something that the city should be providing through LMPD. You know, people that are outside that respond to emergencies anywhere in the city that it is. I'm a little bit concerned that we're being asked to take on a significant additional cost that is already something that the city should be doing. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in minimizing uh, any additional costs that we have to take on uh, because of that. Do you know when we'll have an idea of what the price tag for this will be? Um, yes, at a, before our next meeting. I mean, we have an estimate at this time when we look at depending, and, and this will depend, you know, the safety, like I said, we would really only be adding 10 more of our SSOs. So we would be repurposing the training of those that we already have so that would be 10 new staff members that would be working as SSOs. And then it will depend on how many of the safety administrators we want to add. So, you know, looking at about 45 for middle and high schools is what we would be adding um, with the potential if, we, if the board chooses and we move forward with some identified elementaries as well. But it would be in the neighborhood we believe right now and just a rough estimate between four and five million dollars. Um, what the 20 that we have now, am I correct in remembering that they do a lot of like night patrolling for security or is that somebody else? No, they did do that. Uh, but you know, as we move, they, they're mostly day during the school time. They can do night when school's not in session. Are we going to need more night people or uh, am I asking a misguided question? Um, I think we've done a pretty good job of covering nights at this time. Um, so we may need, uh, we'll see how we do with that, but we've been able to cover that pretty successfully. Okay. Um, is it, just to be clear, is it only the principal of a building, school building, that can authorize the presence of an SSO within the school? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, as part of the training, and apologies if I missed this, or maybe it's uh, a kind of subcategory under one of the things that's listed, is like suicide prevention, uh, one of the things that is included there, because we know our kids are at much greater risk of dying from suicide than they are from some armed intruder. Uh, yes, we would want to make sure that the safety administrator is trained in the recognition, you know, of those signs. And obviously, they, they may not be trained to provide the services, but they right. would be trained in what services to get for the child. And uh, foster that process of getting them into that service. Follow up, correct. Uh, one final uh, set of questions. Uh, I, uh, I have a little bit different recollection than Member Craig does around the policies. I, I think given the development of our, our thinking on this proposal that has happened over the last two years, um, that we should uh, and I, I don't mean this in a total sense, so let me qualify it before you know people maybe <laughs> react. I think we should go back to the drawing board with our policies. That does not mean that we should throw out the policy work that we did. It just means I think we should fully reevaluate it and decide if it's something we want to keep or something that that we want to uh, that we want to alter in light of how our thinking has developed on this. Um, so, you know, that, that would be my hope that we could really go through that process again, hopefully, you know, fairly speedily, but I think we do need to set eyes on each of those policies again and ask, ask ourselves, you know, does this still apply? Is this something we still want to do? Is it in line with the new proposal that was nowhere near what the old proposal was looking like? Um, so I, that would be my fervent hope for that. Um, so. With the pol both the policies and the job descriptions, um, when do you think we can kind of set eyes on a preliminary draft of that stuff? So the policy uh, committee would be, you know, we want that them to begin tackling that within the next couple of weeks. 
Uh, so we'll be setting a policy committee meeting to do that and go through exactly what you just said, um, which is to take what where we were and let's take a look at it and go through each of those things on the policy committee. And then we, we're close to having job descriptions completely ready now. So we anticipate that we could get you. We wanted your feedback first on anything we wanted to add or talk about, but um, we believe we can get that out to you very shortly. Thank you. And then just in conclusion, I mean, I, I think, you know, this is, I think we're moving at a good pace now, um, especially given everything that we have to deal with. Um, I think it's much more important that we focus on getting this absolutely right for how we want to do it than trying to, to meet some, some artificial deadline. Um, so I, I really want to make sure that we don't have to re revisit this uh, needlessly in the future uh, because we rush things through a little bit. Um, so I, I hope we can do it efficiently, but uh, I am definitely going to advocate for us having sufficient time to study what's being given you know, to us to, to vote on and then to debate and discuss it uh, with each other in a, in a public format. So thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a few comments and questions. Um, so um, one of I support something for the elementary schools. I know that we're trying to spread staff out with middle, high, and elementary. I think it's extremely important that we look at elementary schools uh, differently. And I agree with board member uh, Joe Marshall in saying that what we start early can set, uh, set a pace for as, as our students move forward to middle and high schools. And because of that, um, I would like for the board to get a list by district of the number of elementary schools that are in their districts. And also if data still exists, we know the data that we have uh, as it pertains to uh, parent confrontations. And also the consideration is location of some of our elementary schools, um, safe neighborhoods, maybe not safe neighborhoods, but I think that it's, it's uh, critical as we move forward, as we talk about safety and security, that our elementary schools and our elementary students need to be engaged and involved. And the language in speaking to elementary school students is not necessarily the same language that you use with high school students, but I think that we need to move forward together uh, with that. So as you talk about the uh, geographic locations and middle, high and some elementary schools. I would like for us to look for a pattern for elementary schools, not one per school, but how we could group the elementary schools together and have that person assigned only to elementary schools. Uh, that's one of my comments. The other question I have is in putting this together, the SSOs and the city offices, where is uh, our chief of security, Stan Mullen, in this process? Is he at the table? Uh, yes, we've had lots of discussions with, with him on this as well. He was in from the very beginning. Okay. Um, you showed us a uh, conversation that you had with various organizations in the community. I would like to, uh, to suggest that we establish a task force about school safety and security that would include community organizations and members and that there would be meetings not every month, but there should be feedback and uh, meeting opportunities to get their insight as we move forward on this. I think it's extremely important that we get it correct. I don't think that, I think with listening to the voices of others that do this work, it could be helpful. I saw some names on that list of uh, the red dots, for example. That's, uh, I know what they do. So there are people that could have things to say to help us as we move forward with safety and security for our students. Um, so I would like like uh, some conversation or some thought about putting uh, a committee or task force of some kind of committee together that will work with us as we go forward. Um, I have a question about cameras in the schools. All of our schools have cameras. Um, I do not believe our elementary schools all have cameras. Uh, our middle and highs do. I would like to suggest that all schools have cameras. I think that that's an inequity if we have them in some and not all, particularly when we've had schools that have been broken into. 
And as we talk about moving forward and being safe, I think it's important that we have cameras on our own on all of our schools, to be honest. And I think people need to know that we have cameras on the school. Um, also, the uh, there was a comment that there are minutes from the policy committee from X number of dates where there was a conversation about safety and security. I would request that the board members get all those minutes to review. And I heard the request that we look at the policy. So I heard you say that the policy committee would move uh, back together again and, and start talking about some things and when things, when it's appropriate that that would come to the board. But in the meantime, I think it's important for everybody to review what was discussed previously. Although there may be some changes to what was discussed previously, if the board members could be, uh, could receive that information, I think that that would be something that um, perhaps Jonathan could get out to the board members if, if there's no, uh, unless there's a reason why we shouldn't have it. Nope, you will get those out immediately. Okay. Um, and a, as we move forward, I would like for you to keep us posted on how the time frame when the next, when we have to have the special call meeting and when the meetings will be of the policy committee so everybody is clear on how we're moving forward together. Um, thank you for this information tonight and would, um, the schools that you listed on that slide that we had looked at, I'm out of time. The schools that you have looked at on that slide, uh, for example, Atlanta, Miami, Dade, and others, do you have access to their uh, their safety plan in those schools? Um, that I don't know specifically their safety plan. I mean, I'm sure that we they're they're publicly available documents, and then I'm sure that we could. Uh, since most of them are Council of Great City Schools, we could get some of those if that's what you would like to see. I would like for the board to see those. That doesn't have to. That doesn't have to be our policies. But since they were listed on there, that we've looked at those those uh, specific school districts, I would like that information to be available to the board. Um, I realize that's a a lot of reading information, but I think uh, it would be helpful for us to have uh, more resources as we go forward. Uh, to get things developed, if that's not a problem. Yes, uh, that com completes, completes my questions, and I think everybody got their comments and questions. Ms. Duncan, uh, one more question, please, and just, then we're just going to move on. Yeah, just one question. Just one question. Dr. Polio, um, these other districts, who does the safety, uh, who do the safety officers report to in the other, uh, the head of the safety officers, who do they report to? Do they report to the superintendent? Do they report to somebody else in the district? Because I, to me, uh, I have very strong feelings about that they should report to the superintendent. Uh, I don't like in between people on this, but, uh, but ha do you know who the others report to in their situations? I do, it's, it's a variety. So each district does it differently. There are some uh, that report directly to the, or at least the chief reports directly to the superintendent of the, you know, of what we would consider the, the safety officers. But there are others too that, that report to a operation, chief operations officer. So it, it is a, a mix, but I've seen both of those throughout many of the districts. But you will make, you will make a recommendation to us about that when you Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I um, don't see any other hands up. So at this point, is there a motion to receive the safety information this evening? A motion to receive it. Where this is not a approval, it's a receiving it. Board member Dr. Shule and board member Marshall, all those that are in favor, would you please raise your hand of receiving the information? Um, Dr. Chris, I don't see, okay, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. The next item is uh, the overview of the draft budget school allocations and enrollment projections for fiscal year 2022-23. Dr. Polio, would you like to introduce this to the board, please? Yes, thank you, Chair Porter. And this is, um, you know, usually this would be a, a much smaller presentation. We were talking about um, especially school budget allocation standards. Um, but what we have wanted to do, which I think is long overdue, um, is to bring a recommendation or a way that we allocate based on need. So in the past, 
we have based everything on a certain uh, $1 figure for every student. Instead of looking at it equitably, which is to provide schools in the base allocation for uh, students who may need more supports. And so, you know, I think it's long overdue that we do this. We've been working on this for a while. I want to reiterate, though, that this is the base allocation. Uh, this does not mean that when we look at total, we've had some questions about total allocation. Um, how does it compare to what they currently have now? There will be some other, you know, we will provide additional financial supports um, for AIS and things like that. So what you really have to compare it to is the current standard base allocation to the one we are proposing now. I think that is important to look at. Uh, but I'm turning it over to Cordelia Harden, who will be providing you with an overview. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Last December, we presented to you the future state and to accomplish some of the goals of our future state, changes to the allocation formula were recommended for fiscal year 22-23. Tonight, we will be presenting a summary of those changes. Specific details of the allocation changes are included in the agenda documents. We also will provide an update on the ESSER funding and an overview of the draft budget. We still await the decision of the Supreme Court on the tax recall appeal, which will determine how quickly we can address all of the future state priorities. We are continuing to develop the plans needed to reach our future state goals. And due to our ESSER funding, however, we have been able to proceed with some of the future state priorities. Over 67 million of the ESSER funding has been allocated towards technology. ESSER 1 has mainly been provided for the needs of the students during NTI and sanitation of our facilities. ESSER 2 provided support needed to continue learning opportunities for students and providing for the return to in-person school in March of 2021. ESSER 3 provided one-to-one -one technology, flat panels for every classroom, extended learning opportunities for all students, including learning centers, and a continuity of staffing levels. As for funding is not part of the draft budget since it was awarded actually in fiscal years 2020 and 2021. Next, we're gonna provide an overview of the draft budget. This is an overview of the draft budget included in the consent item is a more detailed budget document for your review. Student enrollment projections were used in the development of these budget allocations. The total estimated budget is 1.8 billion. The general fund is over 83%, 1.5 billion of the total $1.8 billion budget. 86% of the general fund budget is direct to schools, 11% is support to schools, which includes transportation, with 3% being business offices. The actual receipts are 1,037 million. Of that 1,037 million, 810.5 million is local, 220 is for the state, and 6.7 billion is federal indirect uh, funding. More detail, again, is provided within the big budget document. Brent West will now present the enrollment projections for next school year. Thank you, and good evening, Chair Porter, board members. I just want to give a brief update on student enrollment projections that we have developed for the initial budget allocations. Um, COVID-19 has obviously made this more challenging the past couple of years than in the past, but we analyzed all the current and his historical data that we have available in order to ensure that funds are properly allocated to schools. We use annual room usage surveys, floor plans, KDE building reports, and infinite campus schedules in order to determine optimal building capacities. Um, our current optimal capacity formula is a best practice formula that we got from Austin, Texas. 100% optimal is the ideal target based on the design of the building, but that does not necessarily mean that a school is completely full. 
So we use an operating range between 75 and 115 percent of optimal that allows schools how to decide how to use their flexible space. So below you will see a timeline and a feedback loop and some examples of tools that we use to develop these projections. So we get the first pupil month enrollments from this year. We analyze the data, develop the projections. We share those with all of the principals so that they have a chance to provide feedback. And then we continue to monitor from now up until the opening of school. So you have the projections as an attachment. Overall, we are expecting our enrollment numbers to be closer to pre-COVID market share going forward for next year. So we, uh, we use geographic information systems to develop dashboards and applications so that we can better analyze data. And we look at data from a number of different sources. You see some of those here. You see an example um, from planning and zoning building permits. So we look at JCPS data, Louisville Metro data, US Census Bureau, uh, state data, and then we also work with the Louisville Jefferson County Information Consortium. So once we have developed these enrollment projections, we hand those over to finance so that they can develop the initial budget allocation. So at this time, I will turn it back over to Ms. Harden. Thank you, Brent. Now we'll discuss the allocation formula proposal. We met with assistant superintendents at all levels. Dr. Aberly also met with principal groups at all levels and individually with some of the principals to understand their needs and obtain their feedback. The feedback overall was very positive. You will hear shortly from two of our principals tonight on their thoughts of the changes we are suggesting. So what has changed? Our goal in developing a new allocation formula was to create an equitable funding formula to meet the specific challenges of schools based on student needs. Instead of funding with a standard staffing formula, funding will be based on student needs, addressing equity in funding, not equal funding, but equitable funding. This revised formula will provide more flexibility to principals and SBDM councils fewer restricted add-ons, providing the flexible funding, which allows schools the flexibility to determine how to use their funds to address the spe specific needs of their students. Last year, we explained part of our future state would uh, be review of all of our budget allocations in departments and schools. We looked at the add-ons closely and many add-ons were replaced with allocations based on the individual student needs. Again, funding following the student. Over the past three years, we researched student-weighted formulas at several of our large districts and have used some of their experiences and recommendation as a guide to our revision to our school allocation were appropriate. Mainly, however, our work has been reviewing how schools were spending their funds, what they were selling, and what they were buying. After meeting with the assistant superintendents and our principals, we were able to develop a formula that meets the needs of our students and our schools. This work has been Dr. Aberly's main focus since joining the finance team. His principal experience has been monumental in moving this work forward. Dr. Aberly will now explain his work on the student weighted formula. Well, thank you. So uh, as, as has already been mentioned, this school allocation proposal is the culmination of hundreds of hours of collaborative work uh, involving input, feedback, and revisions by dozens of school principals, all of the assistant superintendents, JCPS cabinet members, the Office of uh, Diversity, Equity, and Poverty, the JCPS REAP committee, and several other JCPS divisions. And our future state goal of assuring an equitable funding formula to support our high poverty schools has been the driving force in assessing the current levels of support that schools have received traditionally through both the single formula allocation method that we currently use to staff schools and the non-standardized approach that's been used to provide additional funds to those schools through add-ons. And we're excited to present to you a weighted formula approach to support students and schools based on the JCPS needs index which is the composite of the percentage of free and reduced lunch, ECE, ELL, and student mobility. The JCPS needs index is also very strongly correlated with the percentage of students of color 
in the school. Um, one major change to the proposed weighted allocation formula is the development of a teacher staffing formula based on student needs using this needs index. This new formula directs additional funding to schools to assure that we address high need schools. And we have also budgeted a reserve of $7 million to give schools the opportunities to adjust to these new allocations. So the JCPS needs index is determined by the following components, the percentage of free and reduced lunch, any students who qualify for free or reduced lunch, uh, students who meet any ECE disability category, students who qualify for ELL services, and then uh, what's called the percent mobility, the students who move JCPS residents after the start of after the start of your headcount. And due to the fluid nature of this mobility index, which is unique to JCPS, uh, we do use a three-year average in calculating the JCPS needs index for these budgeting tiers. And a cross-sectional analysis of this index found that nearly 70% of the composite index was re represented by students of color. So ultimately, our equity strategy is to support the increased needs of schools, uh, of high poverty schools, by categorizing schools into four tiers that are different with differentiated funding, um, and we're supporting the needs of the individual students within the, within those schools. We also recognize there's going to be uh, adjustments that may be needed in future years. So based on student demographics from the previous year, um, tiers are determined at each instructional level. And these tiers are then used to determine the student to teacher ratios for the teaching staffing allocations at each school. So by comparison, uh, currently all elementary schools are staffed at a standard 24 to one ratio and the middle and high schools are staffed at 28 to one. Um, individual class sizes at a school will vary based on grade level and specific enrollment, uh, space usage, and then teacher assignment decisions made by principals and SPDM counselors. Uh, the result of these recommendations, however, will be increased teacher investment and a more equitable distribution of teachers while providing increased flexibility for schools to buy more teachers uh, if they prefer. And the bottom line is more investment directly into our schools, more flexibility for schools with their allocated funds and a standardized set of tiers to support um, of support that address the needs of the children in our schools. So in addition to the staffing changes that were mentioned, we also recommend a standardized set of operational supports uh, that provide even greater flexibility for schools. We would like to now have Jody Zeller, principal of Westport Middle School, and Jamika Howard, principal of Shelby Traditional Academy, to give you their thoughts and comments on the new formula. Thank you, Dr. Avery Lee and, and Chief Harden. Um, uh, as a principal of Westport Middle School and uh, having been a part of uh, the committees that both Chief uh, Harden and, and Dr. Avery Lee have mentioned, of the budget work over the last couple of months that have, have led to this proposal. Uh, I just wanna thank them for the collaborative nature of the work in and of itself. Um, having the opportunity to uh, react and respond and provide feedback over these last uh, couple of months um, has been invaluable to, to us as leaders to have an idea of, of what's coming for us um, and what options could potentially um, come our way. Some of the things that um, as a principal group, some of the feedback we provided um, were things uh, around the nature of, of kind of being responsive to those different tiered needs. Uh, being a, a school that was um, that is one of the larger middle schools and has a variety of different challenges than some of the other middle schools in the district, um, it was important for us to make sure that whatever changes uh, came forward we're going to be supporting our work long term and, and we feel like some of the feedback we provided and, and the things that are represented in this proposal certainly certainly reflect that. Uh, one of the other the priorities that, that we wanted to communicate to uh, to Dr. Aberly was the importance of the middle school level, especially uh, to, to kind of think about funding from a team perspective and middle schools operate uh, from a team model, which is a, a more of a smaller learning community approach to supporting our students. Uh, but unfortunately, as he mentioned, we are kind of funded at a standard allocation rate um, 
as far as a ratio of, of, of students to, to teachers that do not take into consideration that teaming approach. And so having the opportunity to have uh, the potential to, to fund our schools in the same manner that our schools are managed uh, is, is a huge step forward for us. It's gonna create opportunities for sustainability and consistency across the board, across all of the middle schools uh, within the district that we are certainly excited about. Um, we are, are really appreciative of that opportunity to have uh, some more local control of, of some of the funds that would be allocated to us. Uh, some of those district add-on funds that, that have maybe been grandfathered into our schools or maybe don't fully match our needs this proposal would give us uh, in our site-based committees and our, our budget committees within our school uh, uh, some more flexibility to meet our school specific needs and so uh, certainly kind of having those those priorities of uh, aligning uh, funding with need at the school level uh, at the middle school level funding and a team-based approach uh, and providing a little bit more local control uh, were all things that we were certainly excited to hear and so I know at the middle school level, we are excited for this work moving forward. And I'll pause, pass it over to, to Dr. Howard to talk a little bit more about uh, kind of their perspective from the elementary level. Thank you, Jody. Um, I just wanna say, first of all, that in elementary, we were just elated to be invited to the table. Um, a lot of, especially here lately, you know, dealing with parents and homes and NTI and things, it has really become evident for me as an elementary principal, as a pandemic principal, as an AIS principal, that uh, a lot of folks think that elementary is the way it used to be when we were in elementary. They think we sit around and sing songs and nap and do all these really fun things. And we do do a lot of really fun things, but right now in 2022, our students are facing a lot of really serious issues. They're dealing with traumas and there are a lot of things specifically around academics that uh, folks don't understand that we're dealing with in elementary. And so we are really excited about being invited to the table. And the, the thing that really just kind of got me going was the idea of being able to have 22 to one with students in elementary schools like mine. Again, I'm an AIS principal. And um, so I have students that we must accelerate multiple years every year. And then that being compounded with the the results of the pandemic and students not being able to engage fully in school for the last 18 months, we are being faced with the need to accelerate students at rates that have really in my 19 years have never been, it's always been a need, but now it is a greater need than ever before. And being able to lower those numbers and being able to staff our buildings based on our building needs um, is just, it's, it's going to be a boon for elementary if uh, we get this type of local control over our budget allocations and we are able to consult with those folks who uh, we've been talking through doing things like inter empathy interviews and be able to talk to people with their feet on the ground, the parents, the SCDM, the students, and the families in our community and being able to figure out exactly what we need and being able to have the flexibility and the frankly, the, autonomous, the autonomy and agency to make those changes and do exactly what we need to make sure that we are pushing our students to proficiency and beyond. Um, and with that, I'm just gonna pass it on back to uh, Chief Hart. Um, thank you, Principal Howard and Principal Zeller. Board, tonight we have provided an overview of the enrollment projections and the changes to the school allocation formula. These will be submitted on February 1st for your final review and approval. Also presented was an overview of the general fund draft budget for your review and a recap of the ESSER spending plans. This concludes our presentation and we are available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Harden. We will, uh, the board members will have an opportunity to ask questions or to make comments and we will start with the five minutes. If your answers are taken up to five minutes for one or two questions, then we will give you some additional time. So we will start this time again uh, with board member McIntosh, please, if that's okay with you. Thank you, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, it's the kind of thing I need a lot of time to process and 
sit down with my red pen and, and go through. Um, I do have a couple of um, big questions. One is, are there any scenarios where under this model versus the proposed model versus the current model where a school could see their funding decrease? Yes. So there I'll answer that first and then you can jump in. So yes, there is that potential. We are going to hold harmless um, schools for the next uh, year. So no school would be impacted for the 22-23 school year. Uh, but, you know, and I will say this about the whole thing. We have not looked budget-wise systemically, um, you know, how we fund the entire district. And it really has come down in many cases to the political capital of the principal. Um, and we have to stop budgeting that way and we have to budge from, budget from a systemic view. So we do want to give those uh, that may eventually be going down additional time to do that. But I will say this, this proposal puts about 15 million more dollars into school budgets uh, than what we have right now. And uh, I would like to just add that this is the weighted formula, the basic formula. It does not include where we may make additional adjustments that are needed. Right, right. I just, I like everything up until that some people might go down because I don't know any principals or SBDMs out there that would would say that uh, oh, we've got plenty of money. Um, so I, I do have some I have some concerns um, about that. So maybe if I could, <clears throat> would it be possible to see a couple of just sample um, budgets in which that's the scenario and see how it would impact their staffing and things like that because it's just the kind of thing that I need I personally my learning style need to see something a little bit more tangible as opposed to the hypothetical that would just help me and perhaps others um to just understand a little bit better and sure. just so just so we know I want to be clear on this how this has been created um you know we have add-ons that date back that are still on our budget to probably the 80s um, mm -hmm. that have remained on there because they were a project that was implemented at some time and they've remained on that budget even if it's a one school thing or it uh, that program is not necessarily there or effective anymore that has remained there i'll give an example when i was the principal at jtown and moved to dos and dr hargens asked me to take the principal job at dos i said i would need an extra assistant principal for me to go there. It was added onto my add-on list, an extra assistant principal. That role, that position is still on the budget, even though I've been gone for now five school years. Um, and so maybe they need that. I'm not saying that, but we have to find a way to look at it systemically as opposed to, sure. I wonder why DOS has more assistant principals than someone else. Well, there's there's a reason for that. And some of those don't just date back five years, they may date back 12 or 15 years. Sure. And and I think I'm probably speaking a little bit from my own personal experience, too, in being in a school that, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not the COVID, but I'm still getting over something over here. Um, you know, I'm at the school where I worked, I think, um, years ago, it was 25 to 30% free and reduced. It's more than that now. Um, so we didn't qualify for Title I dollars. And you say, okay, well, that's a very small percentage of the total population. But because the overall population of the school was almost 2,000 kids, you're still looking at nearly 500 free and reduced lunch kids that we didn't get any additional services or funding or programs to help because it was based on percentages. And I know that's not what we're doing here. Um, I just want to make sure that... Um, as we change this, that if we have students who are high need as individual students, but they are not in a high need school, that that individual student is still getting the necessary services and resources that are gonna help them to be successful, despite the fact that may, many of their peers may not need those additional services. So I hope I'm being clear and not, not negative. I just want to, Again, I probably need to see examples or something to make sure um, that I fully am able to, to process all of that. Which and then my second, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to uh, say we can certainly provide examples. Uh, schools have received that information that you're asking for, and we can provide that to you. But one of the th the main focus on this student weighted formula is to address those individual student needs, like free mm -hmm. and reduced lunch (ESL). So that is the purpose of the formula itself, because we recognized. Title I is based on percentages, and in those large schools, you're correct. They would not be getting Title I. This way, they get funding based on their tier, which brings in student needs. Okay. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And then my last, I, I don't think it was touched on, or it was only very um, briefly down at the bottom of one of the slides. It mentioned PTA boosters and, and et cetera were under review. Um, can, can you speak a little bit to what that means? Um, yes, that's a goal of ours. Um, and, you know, it will probably be a requirement of our additional revenue that, you know, we hope to win in the Supreme Court. Um, but we do know an equity issue that we face is some schools um, have uh, PTAs that provide a great deal of financial support, uh, booster clubs that provide a great deal of athletic support, alumni associations, and some of our schools do not. Um, and so we wanna bridge that gap and make sure that we can provide schools that may not have access to those same robust organizations funding wise. They may be very supportive, but they may not have the funding that we provide those um, you know, so for instance, every one of our schools has the playground that the school needs. Um, every one of our schools has the athletic facilities that the school needs. Um, and it's not just based on the ability to raise funds outside of the budget. So that is what we are going to bring you a plan to do in the near future. Okay, thank you. I'll send everything else later. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next would be uh, Dr. Shule, and after Dr. Shule would be uh, Linda Duncan and Joe Marshall. Dr. Shule. Thank you, Chair Porter, and thank you, uh, Ms. Harden and your team for this wonderful presentation. Uh, let me say I am delighted to see Dr. Howard on tonight, uh, giving us her experience with this budget uh, from the perspective of a principal and her colleague as well. I do have a couple of questions. I want to begin by following up on board member McIntosh's question, but I want to ask it in a bit more pointed way. Is um, this formula that has been proposed, will AIS tier four schools lose money? Yes or no? No, they will not. They will not. Okay. Will not. Will you please provide the board I guess maybe a spreadsheet by school that will help us to know uh, what schools are gaining resources and what schools are losing resources. Uh, if I have schools in my district that's, that are losing resources, that will lose resources under this um, formula, I wanna be able to speak to that uh, and I wanna be able to understand what's happening with those schools. So could you please, um, provide that to the board with us. I will, and if I could just say once again, I wanna reiterate it's it's base funding, you know, so that where the AIS would not lose funding is when we supplement those schools with additional support services and funding. So, mm -hmm. but we will provide you a comparison between current funding and what the tiered system looks like. Thank you. Um, another question about AIS schools. Are they losing funding that will help them to support school improvement? They won't lose that either. Uh, no, uh, definitely not. And we're hoping that the governor's budget goes through, which I think he uh, proposed an additional 14 million for these schools as well. But um, they will not, as of now, from the state funding, they will not be losing any. I was looking at the needs index earlier, and I was curious as to why proficiency in reading and the diversity index is not included in uh, the needs index. I'll let Tom answer that. Tom, do you have some thoughts on that? 
Uh, yes, sir. The, the JCPS needs index has been established for over 10 years or so through JCPS accountability and research. Um, so what they've done is that that index uh, has been uh, was developed to as a predictor for exactly what you're talking about, the student achievement, um, so that we could direct resources towards schools based on the needs, the JCPS needs. Um, we're simply using it from a budget standpoint for the first time, using that as a way to identify categories, four categories or tiers of schools to be preemptive to direct funding towards schools that uh, uh, demonstrate a, a, the student needs through the metrics of that index, which is ECE, ELL, free and reduced lunch and, and mobility. And, and working with Dina Dossett, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we are very cognizant of our students of color and the representation within uh, the the uh, the measures within that index, and we uh, determined it to be seventy percent or greater aligned. Uh, seventy percent or greater of the uh, data was representative of our students of color within that. Okay, thank you, yes, um, Dr. Polio. One more question: Am I reading this? Um, allocation, budgetary allocation formula correctly um, to say that schools with 400 plus students will receive a full-time librarian and clerk and schools with less than 400 students will receive a part-time librarian and clerk. Is that what I'm reading? I do not believe so. Um, I, I'm going to need some help on that, Ms. Harden. I think, um, I don't believe that's correct, is it? No, every school that we have will receive a uh, librarian. Um, I'm trying to, I'm looking now to see where the, uh, probably what you're looking at is uh, like on the elementary schools, we have increased it that instead of at 660 students, uh, we've increased that they would have a 1.0, uh, a full-time, library media clerk where normally it was at 400 students so now it's going to be at the 660. okay but if a school has less than that they will still have a full-time yes uh, librarian yes yes every school it's an agreement also in our contract with jcta that every school will have a full-time librarian yes okay. all right thank you Thank you, Dr. Schull. Uh, Ms. Duncan, and after Ms. Duncan, uh, Joe Marshall, please. One of the uh, one of the things I'm worrying about with this is the complexity of this among our elementary schools and the variety that we have among our elementary schools, and whether implementing this for elementary this year is is the best thing or whether we should wait and give this more time uh, for us to ask these questions because I, I need to be able to sit and talk just like Sarah was asking for uh, some of that information um, to be able to digest a bit. And I think, I think we all do. It's, this is kind of a, a very difficult explanation of, of these things that I think we just need a little more time on, uh, our, especially our elementary, because we're all looking at our own schools and even the variety within our own schools, uh, how this is going to uh, affect them. You know, if, if we do this and we see scores drop where we've moved staffing from one school uh, and, and and in money and tried to put it at another school, but then that school that we moved it from drops in scores. Um, it are, is that something that we're prepared to accept, accept that that might have that kind of impact on this? There are just, I just feel like there's so many things that uh, we need to, to think about with our elementaries, especially uh, over this year, we're trying to this on top of the other big issues that we're facing um, I don't know. I, I just feel like maybe we need a little more time with this. 
See, I'm having trouble with the weighting. I'm, I'm not understanding why ESL has a 0.05 weight compared to pre-reduced lunch at 0.5 or mobility at 0.3. Or, I mean, it sounds like there's not much weight given to uh, ELL. Uh, and, and I know it, what impact large numbers of ELL students can have on a school. So um, the weighting part, can you explain why that is so low for ELL? Is that from the needs index, Dr. Averly? I think we need to go to Dina on that, please. Yes, sir. Dina and her department used um, their evaluation process to design that. So Dr. Dossett, can you share, please? Sure. The um, needs index, as Dr. Averly mentioned, has been around for over 10 years. And so those weights were established several years ago. In fact, I think one of the recommendations that we'll have moving forward is that we look um, periodically at the needs index and the weights to determine whether they need to be adjusted. But in the at the time where those weights were established, um, we did a regression analysis and looked at um, how well each of those factors predicted student achievement outcomes. And those were the betas, uh, the beta weights that were given from that regression analysis. So that was just strictly based on a statistical analysis at, the, at that time. But okay. I think it's probably worth revisiting um, periodically to make adjustments based on our student demographics and shifts. I think we- But, it, I, but I it's still right that. now is, is, is um, based on our latest analysis, um, those weights um, in general still hold. But also, um, Ms. Duncan, remember that we have the ESL department that also supports schools in addition to the needs index that we're using there's also the staffing that they provide to schools based on the needs of the individual school for ESL. Okay, I just want to make sure that we're recognizing their needs uh, because sometimes I feel like they're still needing more, uh, and I hear that that they they need more. They they send them people, but then they sometimes they need more. Their populations are, are growing. Uh, Ms. Duncan. And all of them. If I could add in just a couple of points. First of all, I want to say, you know, that will be up to you all how we tackle this. Elementary is definitely more difficult uh, with all the factors that will go into it. But I will say, looking at per pupil funding in schools, when we have been evaluating this, high school and middle school line up fairly close to what you would expect when especially around pre and reduced lunch. Elementary school is where we have the most inequities right now in our current funding model. Um, when we look at that and say, you know, that over the course of the past couple of decades, for instance, programs have been added to schools that still remain there. And especially when you deal with a much smaller school, that has a huge impact on per pupil funding at a school. So. You know, we can take a look at that, but I'm going to tell you the most inequity occurs at our elementary schools right now that needs to be fixed. And number two, once again, this is adding 13 million to school budgets. It's 13 million. So most, you know, the vast majority of schools that are in need, especially, are gaining from this. Where is that 13 million coming from? I know, uh, is it coming from moving around or is it coming from additional money? It's additional money right now that we are earmarking for schools. Okay, I just don't want uh, want people to be, um, you know, I just don't want that reduction. Uh, and I realize what you're saying about programs that some some of them, you know, have ended and they're still being funded. But uh, I, I still think we have to be really careful. We have uh, class small class size schools that have operated that way and and under this situation they're seeing that they're going to be losing staffing and where they've made some progress and in, in, in with the kids that they've had uh, now then if that progress recedes are, are we going to be you know is that what we want or are they going to be the collateral damage to having a new system like this i'm, I'm just worried about that 
I'm also eventually we've got to have it in line where all schools, you know, that we have a systemic approach to funding it. That's why we're given at least a full year to do that. And obviously providing additional supports based on need around AIS, ESL, as you said, uh, but I'll give you an example. We still have on the add-ons for high schools trimester. It, they, we don't word it as trimester anymore, but they're still the trimester teachers that were added for high school several years ago, many years ago, to convince schools to go to trimester. Those are still on the budgets. And that was at least a decade ago, if not more. I was at Jaytown High School at the time. So, you know, those yeah. are still sitting on the budget and we have to go at a systemic view of this as opposed to that type of funding. Right, I understand that. Oh, also had concern about class sizes. When I see, it looks like in our tier one schools, which would be the least need, we have 26 to one at middle and high school. And then the tier four school, which has the most need on high school level, just reduces 1.7 students on that teacher pupil ratio thing which makes no sense to me when, you know, I, I, I taught, when I taught advanced classes at Southern many years ago, I had my largest classes uh, were 31. And we went, we floated up and it worked fine because those students were great to work with and I didn't, didn't have issues with those. But the smallest classes, you know, need the lowest, I mean, the highest tier need here needs to have the smaller uh, class size. And I don't think a 1.7 difference is significant enough. Uh, why can't we move up the tier one and move down the tier four? We can do that if you choose. I think 1.7 is a pretty big number when it comes to funding, but if that's what you choose to do, we can do that. Well, I mean, if you're adding adding uh, students to the tier one and you're reducing them for the tier four um, it, it it should work out in some way uh, but I, I think 26 to one I mean that sounds great as a teacher that would be wonderful but uh, a tier one school uh, to me should be the one that has the higher teacher pupil ratio uh, beyond the need or the tier four school. And I just, uh, I just didn't make any sense to me looking at that. I mean, a reduction, <laughs> uh, two kids, maybe two kids, 1.7, I don't know what that is, but uh, two kids difference uh, in a high needs class, I don't know how significant that is for us. And so that was a, that's a concern for me. Or do you, can also, you answer that please? Yeah. Yes, I, I want to mention that right now, what we're funding is 28 to 1. For so, every school. Yes. Every school's equal at 28 to 1 right, right now. Right, right. So, you know, it's almost at a tier four, that's almost five students to one um, versus that 28 now is 24 point, or if you agree to this, will be 24.3. And the flexibility of the schools now to be able to purchase more teachers should they decide to do so because of all the flexibility we're giving them in this formula. So they can reduce that class size even yes. more. Yes. Okay, that will be their choice and they're not gonna be penalized for, for reducing that. They'll, we will provide the money for them to be able to do that. It's, we're, not, flex, we're not going to penalize them. <laughs> no, we're not going to penalize them. It's a, none of, no one's being penalized. It's within that flexibility that many of the schools have that flexibility to purchase more. Okay. Well, um, the only thing, the other thing that I didn't have a good explanation on, a clear understanding on, is when we were talking about the different groups and the needs index. And I guess this is a Dina question. Uh, the percents. There's no mention of what it takes. I mean, if you have ESL versus if you have 200 ESL and that's half of your population, is there, is there any uh, distinction on, based on the percentage of the groups that, you're, you're in, that are in your needs index? Because we don't see that in this, what we're looking at. 
Yeah, that, I mean, the it's, overall it's, the overall needs index is calculated with those weights, but it's based on the percentage of that those students in your building. So the percentage of EL students in your building or the percentage of free and reduced lunch students in your building. But do you see how why that's not I mean, that's not clear to me because when we say it's weighted 0.5 free and reduced lunch, I don't know what that means in terms of um, the percent of students that are actually in a building. Um, that's I, I don't understand how the percent is being reflected in that. Oh, so you multiply the percent of students in each of those categories by the weight and you add those up and that gives you your total needs index for the school. So the percentage okay. of free and reduced lunch times 0.5 plus the percentage of EL students times 0.05 plus the percentage of students that are considered mobile times 0.3. Okay. And okay. you add all that up and it's your needs index total. All righty, I understand that. Okay, well, uh, that's all of the questions I have, but I still think we need to be able to have time to talk to talk uh, about this. And 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 because we get questions from our principals too, and we need to be able to to talk uh, with knowledge about uh, and answer questions that that are posed to us about this, because otherwise it looks like we're approving something that we really don't know what the impact is. And I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. So I hope that we can have some more time that we can talk individually about uh, uh, about this and the impact it's going to have on all of our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Uh, before uh, I ask a board member Marshall to speak, uh, Dr. Polio, is it possible for the board members to contact uh, Dr. Dossett and uh, Cordelia Harden, because there are questions that need to be answered, and I'm not sure that we have meeting time scheduled for that. So what is the recommendation to get these questions answered so that it's clearer and more understanding? Do you have a recommendation for that? Yeah, I'd be happy to set um, Cordelia and Dina up to, to meet with anyone who wants to go through questions and ask, um, you know, and get more information about it. Okay, don't be mad at me, Dr. Dossett or Cordelia, but I saw her <laughs> smile. Yeah, I do. I saw her smile too, and I, I still want her. I still want us to smile at each other. This is very critical as it pertains to moving forward with uh, dollars for our school. So I will be quiet and turn it over to Joe Marshall. After which will be James Craig, and then after which will be Dr. Chris. Mr. Marshall, Chair Porter. Um, thank you, everyone, for the work on this. I received a call from one of my principals. Uh, in my district uh, that is excited about this proposal and the step forward that it is uh, to be more equitable in how we provide funds to schools. Uh, but I also think there are a lot of questions that still remain to be answered uh, so that at the end of the day, this is about our students. This is about our kids. It's about taking care of our babies. So uh, especially our principals uh, and our teachers still have a lot of questions. So um, I know I personally would ditto everything that people have said as far as uh, having more time to look at this, look at some examples, and to get a little bit more feedback. But uh, overall, what I'm hearing is this is a step in the right direction. So my extra questions, I'll send through email to get those answered, uh, and then I'll turn my time back in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Board Member Craig. I'm going to need one of those Dina and Tom calls to understand the needs index more. <laughs> so sorry, Dina, but if I can get on your calendar, I'd appreciate it. Uh, and won't belabor the point because we've already been over it uh, several times. Here's a question for you, Dr. Polio. How does the um, current crisis with respect to uh, the teacher shortage play into the aspirational goals that you're building into this budget? Because can't we say that we want 24, 26, and 28 to 1 ratios, but it's really meaningless until we actually have the bodies available to hire? Yeah, well, it's a huge concern. Obviously, it's something we're talking about with principals right now as you begin to, to look at your budget and potentially create new teacher positions. You have to be able to ask, is it a fillable position? 
especially those positions with very specific certifications that might not be out there. So we have told our principals that, um, you know, and it's, it, or, you know, if it's adding a resource teacher to uh, a budget, then where, you know, is that going to pull a teacher out of a classroom, which would create a vacancy? So all of that comes into it, but what happens with it, which we don't have right now, is the site-based councils will have more flexibility with those funds. So they can take the funds and say, you know, we would like X amount of teachers with it, or we would like X amount of assistant principals, or we would like another counselor. You know, Dr. Howard spoke to that. Right now, there's not flexibility with those add-ons. They're locked into certain things that may have been add-ons for many, many years. And the principal comes in, you know, Dr. Howard at, at Shelby, um, you know, has been there two years, I believe, um, you know, and she may be locked into something budget-wise that's been on that budget for the better part of a decade. Now we'll be transferring that over to site-based council who gets to make decisions on what the school needs with those funds. So if they can't, if they can't, if it's not necessarily a teacher they can find, they can repurpose that in other ways. Um, thank you. Do we have the data available to us already? I know that we can see the teacher openings um, throughout the district, but uh, can we see in, in an easy to digest um, spreadsheet or, or whatnot uh, by building what openings are available? There, there's a main link that you've sent to me before with openings throughout the district that I've looked at, but I don't remember seeing it by school. I guess the point of the question is, before we vote on this, would we be able to see what openings are in the district and in the schools that would be classified as tier one, two, three, and four? Uh, yes, I believe that's on uh, several emails, the link, but yeah. uh, it's by school, but we'll, we'll send it to you again. Um, using the the aspirational goal here of increasing the student teacher ratio to talk about the staffing shortage, which is, I know we're going to talk about shortly with NTI, but is the main reason that we're in NTI. Um, would it be possible to add to the agenda uh, of one of our upcoming work sessions or board meetings, an open discussion where we frankly uh, attack the the teacher shortage and have a, a frank discussion about what has led to it and where we see the district going in the next 10 years. I know we've got a lot coming up in the next three or four months, but can we add that to our plate? Sure, I'm happy to discuss that with Chair Porter and, and Vice Chair Shull, but I'll put it on the requests. I think we can have um, that discussion. Thank you. I. I in response to Ms. Duncan's question earlier about the source for the additional $13 million, I know we're adding $13 million. Where is it coming from? Where, what is it being cut from? Cordelia? It's, it's not being cut from anywhere. Um, we have, as the board, um, levied the additional taxes as part of the future state. And one of your priorities was to provide okay. funding um, we are, I, I am confident, and I believe the superintendent feels confident that uh, the Supreme Court will go in the direction that we uh, feel <laughs> is I'm going I'm sorry, I, I missed that point. This is all then contingent on the victory at the Kentucky Supreme Court. Well, that um, right now, because of the way our revenue is, we're able to cover this. There's, it's not a problem. Um, so it's just on an ongoing basis, any future um, increases will possibly be impacted by how the Supreme Court goes. But right now, the budget that you have been given, we are at a $3 million um, shortage, I guess. But again, we've got vacancy credit to cover that. So we're basically a balanced budget and it includes these allocations as well as a reserve of 7 million is included in that. So we're, we are covered without covering the, um, looking at the new money that's coming from the new tax. Okay, when you say vacancy allocations, I think that's what you said, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Well, 
um, I meant vacancy credit, I'm sorry. Vacancy credit. Right, when we have uh, vacancies uh, in positions, and sometimes it is uh, created by a delay in maybe hiring. So as a person leaves, it may take us a couple of weeks or a month to get a new person in. So we budget based on average salaries and assuming that they are going to be in the position um, every day of their contract. But that in reality does not always happen. So right. we end up with some vacancy, what we call vacancy credit. And what we have included in this budget is approximately $25 million in vacancy credit. Uh, some years it's been 30 million. So we feel confident on the 25 million, especially with what we're dealing with now on COVID. I'm trying to rephrase so that I understand everything that you just said. And I don't mean this to be critical, mm -hmm. but what you just said, does that mean that we're able to allocate for more teachers next year to lower the teacher student ratio because we didn't have enough teachers this year and we have leftover <laughs> funds? Um, it hasn't got anything to do with this specific year. This is, uh, this is a normal process in that the way we budget, we use average salaries. And then when everything comes in at the end of the year, it's on, based on actuals. So the difference between average and actuals, it, that's part of the reason that it creates what we call a vacancy credit. It's, it's not just the fact that we don't have teachers in positions or bus drivers in positions. Obviously that is part of it, but- A regular that, person talk for you, board member Craig. <laughs> Ms. Murphy will be leaving us at the end of the week. We probably won't be able to replace it for four to six weeks, so no one yeah. will be receiving a check during that time. Right, right, right. There, that's it. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to have more on this too later. Uh, I, I tend to agree with what Ms. Duncan was saying about ECE and English language learners. Uh, I just need to learn more from Tom and, and Dina about the needs index and how we've used it previously. Um, I think my best friend in the district is an ECE teacher at one of my schools, and I mean, my sense from my relationship with that person and, and other ECE teachers throughout the district is that the point one five probably doesn't cover the additional cost of um, uh, the needs that ECE students present in individual buildings, let alone the English language learners. So, um, mm -hmm. but we'll have more discussions about that going forward. And add me to the list of folks who wants uh, to see the spreadsheet. I'd love to see every. Uh, each of the 155 plus schools in the district listed uh, what they would have received under the old formula and what they would receive under the new. And thank you. And I, I do just want to add, though, if we increase one formula, something else is going to have to go down or we're adding more money to the budget. We're adding more to schools. So as we say, something needs to be more, either we're going to be less or it's going to be more funding going into it. And, and I recognize that, and I know that uh, perhaps more in my district than any other, I've got some schools that might be uh, um, going into the red under this new formula. Uh, and I can defend that to folks in Prospect and Middletown, but I got to know what those schools are going to be getting so that I can have those conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Polio, with the, the request for the spreadsheet, would you make sure that every board member receives that information, please? I think we yes, might have more, more than we're asking for, but it, there's never too much information when it comes to making sure the money is equitable in all of our schools. Uh, Dr. Chris, it's your turn now. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the principals for being here. I'm sure you all have had a long day already. Um, thanks to Dr. Everly. Dr. Everly, are you the same guy that's a local hip hop celebrity? Is that, am I, am I thinking of the right person? Uh, just a cameo showing, that's all. Oh, okay. All right. I wanted to all everybody say. Um, so I think this is great. Uh, we've been talking about it for a long time. I think I first mentioned it in January 2017 uh, at my first board meeting uh, where I, I think we did this. Um, so I'm really happy ab about where we are. Um, so uh, thanks, for, thanks for the work. And just, I, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about this formula, but if I'm, if I'm hearing correctly from the, the data folks um, and the budget folks that we've had this formula 
for the better part of a decade, right? And we have found over that time that it is very accurate in predicting the level of student need a, a, in terms of producing equitable outcomes. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So, so it's a time-tested formula. It's just that we want to now apply it on the front end instead of just looking at the back end and see, oh, <laughs> we, if we had only done this, you know, maybe we could have avoided these outcomes. So, um, so the formula seems, you know, looking at it in that light, you know, we've essentially had over 10 years to refine it. And that's not to say that, that it, it, everything shouldn't be continually examined and, and perhaps refined as things change, but 10 years is a pretty long time to have a chance to, to, to measure it against actual data and determine how reliable it is. So that's, I think that's really good news. Um, the uh, question I have, why, uh, what's the rationale, and I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong at all, for having different peer thresholds with that needs index for elementary, middle, and high? Tom, I'll let so, you answer that. Right. Um, yeah, no, actually, uh, that's a, a great question, and I, I've got a mathematical answer for it. Since the index is based on percentages, um, your percentage is based on the number that you're using, right? And the, the average school size of an elementary school versus the average school size of a middle versus the average of a high is vastly different in JCPS. Okay. Um, so ultimately, I was... You know, I was kind of hoping maybe we'd luck out and the same threshold would apply to all schools, but it just didn't make sense to try to apply that that index, which is based on percentages, and try to make it work for um, such vastly different um, fractions, you know, average school size of elementary, Absolutely. middle, and high. And that's why there's just a very small variation among the three instructional levels. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, based upon what Dr. Polio has said, you know, the, it's clear the way that we're doing it right now, if we don't change anything, is pretty woefully out of date. Um, so, you know, that it's not like what we're doing now is anywhere close to uh, perfect, even if, you know, you might think that, that what we're going to is not going to be perfect. Um, it, it's, uh, we're in a, we've got a, a pretty blunt instrument that we're using right now, but it's not suited to the current times and has some, you know, holdovers from decades past. So uh, again, I'm really excited about this. I mean, if we're serious about equity, you know, this is clearly the, the direction that we have to go. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that, that we're doing so. Uh, and I hope that, you know, folks that want to get more information about it can get it really quickly um, so that we can, we can go ahead and uh, we can go ahead and adopt this. Thank you. Is that all, Dr. Chris? Is that all, Dr. Chris? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, a, a few questions. Uh, first of all, as we talk about the uh, equity of the budget, do the, do the budgets and things like that go through the racial equity process? How, how, how does uh, the REAP process work with uh, the budgets that are going out to our schools? Um, any budget request uh, that we we are presenting, yes, it goes through the REAP process. And uh, Tom, you want to talk about what all you have done uh, with the REAP? Right. Well, particularly with this budget proposal, it's gone through the, the REAP. Uh, the cabinet um, uh, has reviewed it as well as the uh, it's been the REAP itself was presented to the Office of Equity. Uh, diversity, equity, and poverty, and then the JCPS REAP committee uh, also used it. But uh, you were also talking about at a school level as well. SBM councils are expected to reap all their major decisions. So the, at a school level, the budget should be reaped as well. Okay, thank you. Um, also, um, when we when you developed the tiers one, two, three, and four, how did you determine what was going to be in what tier? Um, uh, when you say what's going to be in what tier, uh, could you be a little more specific? Uh, for example, if you, if you have AIS schools that may be an AIS school and a magnet, are they 
what tier are they in versus a, a regular magnet program? Are all the magnet programs for middle and high school in one particular tier versus magnet schools? Because I have AIS schools that are magnet schools also. So how do you determine the tiers? Right. So the tier is determined by the exclusively by the JCPS needs index, and that's provided in the addendum to the standards allocation document that was provided. Um, and that's why that's been such a major point of discussion. The AIS schools uh, at the um, at the high at the at the high school level, all the AIS schools happen to fall in tier four, but at the elementary and middle. Um, there were a few AIS schools that fell into tier three, um, but most of them were in tier four. Okay, um, thank you. This uh, does not, this is a, a general question, uh, Cordelia, that I will ask of you. Over the Christmas break, I had uh, conversations with two parents that were trying to get their students uh, extra tutoring after school, but students don't have textbooks that they're allowed to bring home. Uh, after school. So with all the extra money and everything that we've been getting uh, during this time, is there some way we can see that schools have textbooks that can go home with students that are trying to get after school tutoring? Uh, could you explain that to me, please? The textbooks, we provide funding for um, based on every student for every school. And the textbooks, whether they purchase actual books or instructional resources, is a school decision. We've not gotten involved in that. If there is a particular school that says they don't have funding to purchase textbooks, um, I would need to look at that particular school and see how they have used their funding. The question that has always been asked since I've been on the board as a board member, do schools have textbooks? And the answer has always been yes. Mm -hmm. The situation is that the schools have textbooks for the students in the classroom, but those classroom books cannot go home. So how can we manage that? Because if we need to make sure that the books are staying at school, but we also need to be able to pro provide books for students that are trying to get help after school. So is there a, is there a way to resolve that situation? Uh, we certainly can review it and see um, what needs to be done. Okay. Because we want, we want to make sure the students have what they need to um, for that those extra learning times that they are at learning centers or getting tutoring service or at home. Okay, thank you. Um, question about, as we talk about giving schools extra money and you mentioned giving schools extra money to, to hire teachers, if the money is not spent to hire the teachers because the teachers are not there to hire, will the schools leave, lose the money going forward if they cannot fill those slots that particular year or will they have that opportunity to continue filling those slots going forward? They'll have the opportunity to continue. Um, again, this is flexible money. We're trying to make um, as much flexibility for schools as possible. So if they, for some reason, decide they they can't fill a position and they decide to sell that position, then that becomes part of their flexible money. Okay. Back to the, to, to the uh, AIS, AIS schools that have magnet programs. It's under this funding process, will these schools maintain the budget that they have and perhaps get additional money going forward? Or is there a potential for the AIS schools that are magnet programs to lose dollars with the proposal that's being put before the board for a vote? Uh, at this point, we are not planning on uh, taking away from any AIS school. They are, we are applying the formula, but they will be provided additional funds so that they do not lose any money. Okay, so in order for the board members to vote, we're gonna see uh, information that has applied the formula but we're also gonna see that they're gonna have every every dollar that they need to move forward because that's very frustrating and causes a lot of unnecessary anxiety. So uh, there are some principal concerns and uh, it's our job to speak for our schools. So I just wanna make sure that, you know, we don't need any more anxiety going into 2022. So I just wanna be clear that the principals are clear that the money will be there for their schools and for any particular programs that they have. 
Yes. And what we have looked at is one process, one part of the funding problem part, uh, process, but not the whole process. Is that correct? That's correct. This is the weighted uh, school allocation portion based on the student weighted needs. Okay. Um, any other questions out in the interest of time, I'll send any other questions. I would like to thank the principals for being there, particularly uh, Dr. Howard, nice to see you since we can't see each other face to face. Uh, thank you for all the work that you continue to do. I look forward to seeing you one day before I turn 90, I will say that. So uh, thank you uh, for our principal from Westport Middle School. Thank you also for being there this evening. And um, if there are no additional questions, are there any additional questions before I ask for the vote to receive this information? Any other questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to receive the updates from the draft budget school allocation and enrollment projections for the fiscal year 22-23. And I'm gonna add on that we've requested some additional meetings and some additional information. So is there a motion to, uh, to receive what we have received this evening? Uh, Board Member Marshall, seconded by uh, Dr. Chris. All those in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation this evening. Our last presentation moving forward happens to be the new way forward. Dr. Polio, if you'd like to introduce that, please. Yes, thank you, Chair Porter and board members. And obviously, um, we had hoped by this time that maybe we would be moving past the new way forward. But as we know, uh, especially over the past month, um, it has intensified and changed with the Omicron variant um, that has um, really uh, exploded within our community and our school community as well. So we did wanna bring you an update specifically around staffing, around NTI days, around the decision to use NTI this week. We wanted to make sure that you were aware of that and get your feedback um, as we move forward because we do know we are limited in the amount of NTI days that we have um, and could continue well into January, uh, towards the end of January with uh, this variant. Um, so I think it's an important time to present this to you. Obviously, these same guiding principles you've seen multiple times, uh, many times over the past 24 months is going on two years now uh, that we've been in the pandemic. Uh, in about two months, it'll be two years and never thought we would be that far along. But um, as you can see, these are our guiding principles. But I will immediately turn it over to Eva Stone, who I wanna recognize and thank again uh, for all of her work. I know it's been challenging and difficult and something she never thought she would sign up to be a part of, but she has done a wonderful job for JCPS. Eva. Thanks, Dr. Polio. I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the mitigation measures that we have in place just um, as those continue. Um, we've got our mask mandate and the, in, the masks are required um, for everyone who's inside our buildings and on our buses. Um, to, if the requirement is that they're properly masked. Um, this practice remains in place and it, it has been very effective in, in helping our success thus far with being back to back to in-person learning um, prior to the Omicron variant, but still has been, been helpful with this new variant. Um, if a student doesn't have a mask, there's one provided upon entry to the building. And masks also are available for employees as well. And um, KN95 masks were delivered to the schools for employees and those are stocked in the warehouse. The voluntary testing continues and it's available weekly in schools and work sites. And while we've been on NTI, the testing sites are open. They've been open for expanded hours and um, staff on site still have accessibility to the, the testing in their buildings. Uh, the drive-through sites are open at um, 50 sites after school. And again, this week while we're on NTI, there's been expanded hours of operation for those. And of course, the vaccine or testing mandate for employees, um, the test to stay program, the test to play programs, those have all been very instrumental in, in helping um, with our return to learning. And of course, um, employees, folks who have questions about those measures not being followed can, can speak with the principal and with their assistant superintendents for more information. And then I'm sure as we know, so when the slides were presented, uh, posted, they were still waiting on some updated guidance from the Kentucky Department for Public Health. That guidance has been issued. So we're working on reviewing those 
those updated recommendations and, and seeing how they fit with our, um, our current measures. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Moore. Thank you, Dr. Stone. Um, I'm gonna give you a brief update of our, what would be our third stint of non-traditional instructional days since the start of COVID-19. Although we did make the decision on Sunday to return to NTI, our building leaders have been preparing uh, since the winter for the potential to transition to remote learning since winter break. We sent a checklist to principals as a reminder of the expectations for equitable access and learning opportunities for all of our students. And I, I, and I believe that, you know, and even though it's anecdotally, uh, it's the reason why we were able to transition seamlessly from in-person learning uh, to NTI today. Uh, I've received uh, messages from every single principal uh, of, of the success of many of our schools. But we also plan, we also explained that this is different than when we entered into a remote learning for the 2021 school year. Um, one, it's a much shorter time frame. As you can see, the legislature provides us with 10 days uh, for a district um, and must close for health or safety reasons. And number two, um, for, uh, for the first time, teachers have established a relationship with their students. So I think that's very important and uh, a big difference from our last time we were in uh, uh, NTI, NTI 2.0. Uh, so we really are looking at this as an opportunity for us to use those factors to establish a schedule that is uh, close to their regular schedule as to the extent practicable. And I think this gives us an opportunity to provide uh, services that meet the needs of our, of our students much more effectively than NTI 2.0, just because of the nature of us knowing uh, our, our students. Um, and after this week, uh, after we use these four days, we will be down to six days that we'll have to, to, to use and be uh, strategic on how we use those days in order to, um, uh, one, um, be, be safe and, uh, and uh, honor the safety of our students and staff, and, and two, try to return to in-person and have as much in-person instruction um, as possible. And you can see that according to state law, uh, teachers must work from the school building unless they are isolated or, or quarantined. And, uh, and we really see this as another opportunity for us to leverage support for our student. Uh, having uh, staff report uh, creates a more collaborative environment in, in, our, uh, in our schools uh, for a situation when there's a substitute teacher uh, in, in the building, they need some support. They can just go right next door now uh, and, and collaborate with grade level or content uh, level uh, teachers uh, for, for support. Not worry about, about having class coverage or anything like that. Everyone is right there. And then we have some new teachers who are a little uncomfortable or don't have as much experience with uh, remote uh, instruction uh, and, and don't have much much experience because they're brand new and uh, haven't lived through the whole COVID-19 experience. So that's another uh, support system in place since they are all uh, reporting, unless they are isolated or, or quarantined. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Greenwell. She's gonna give us a snapshot of our, uh, of our staffing issues and really the reason why we had to transition to NTI. Thank you, Chief Moore. As you know, we monitor employee absences on a regular basis, uh, certainly daily and several times a, a day and in the evenings. When students returned after the winter break, we saw an increase in absences, which corresponded to the increase in COVID cases, which resulted from the surge from the Omicron variant. We continue to monitor this data and it will help and continue to help us inform the decisions that we have to make around staffing and NTI needs. You're looking at what we saw to be the trend uh, leading up to where we are now. Now I'll turn it over to Chuck who will give you some information on the Thanks, Amy. Um, as uh, all members know, the legislative session has begun for this year. It is a 60-day session because we are in even year. Uh, that also means it's a budget session. Uh, the session kicked off last Tuesday, January 4th, and will continue up to April 15th. It could adjourn earlier than that, but they are limited to 60 legislative meeting days. Um, I think they are currently scheduled to uh, adjourn on April 14th, but that can always change. Um, some particular committee meetings that I think you'll want to uh, pay particular attention to. Uh, the House Education Committee uh, traditionally meets Tuesdays at 8 a.m. 
um, the House Budget Review Subcommittee on Primary and Secondary Education uh, meets Tuesdays at noon, and the Senate Education Committee uh, meets Thursdays at 11.30 a.m. Uh, those are the normal meeting uh, times. However, uh, those can uh, change, and they can have special meetings. Um, in fact, I'm expecting a special meeting of uh, some of them very frequently. Um, some of the issues uh, that we've already dealt with this week um, that I want to put in front of you, uh, one that is of particular attention uh, to the board members is the state redistricting bills uh, that passed uh, on Saturday. Uh, they are still uh, subject to the governor's signature or veto, so they have not been enacted yet. Um, but one of the provisions in House Bill 2, uh, which was the uh, redistricting bill for state house districts, um, provided that um, the county boards of election um, have to update their precinct lines to accommodate uh, the new leg state legislative districts uh, within 45 days of the uh, bills going into law. Uh, that will be in the next couple of weeks or so, depending on when the governor signs or if he vetoes and then the legislature overrides those vetoes. Uh, but we anticipate currently that about the first week of March or so, um, we will have those final precinct lines and we can begin our work in earnest of uh, beginning the work of drawing um, with, your, with your help and cooperation, the, uh, the board districts for uh, the state for the uh, Jefferson County Board of Education. Uh, another bill that is currently moving through the legislative process um, is Senate Bill 25, which is an update to the special session legislation uh, that passed back in September. Um, three major items uh, from that bill. Number one, uh, we expect that bill to pass by the end of this week, if only because um, there are provisions from last special session that deal with um, the return of retired teachers and retired uh, classified staff. Um, those expire on January 15th, and everybody is in agreement that those need to be extended. Um, and so we do expect that to happen by the end of this week so that those retirees who came back under uh, Senate Bill 1 from the special session can continue uh, for the spring semester. Uh, another piece of that was, um, whereas for the spring semester, there were 20 remote instruction days. These are in addition to NTI days remote instruction days that could be used on a school by school basis or um, even a classroom by classroom basis. Um, a major difference in the current version of Senate Bill 25 is that whereas for the past fall semester, each day added to the district's total. So we had 20 days for the district as a total, but it wasn't 20 days per school. Um, so if you used one day at Atherton High School, the next day you used it at Cameron Middle School, that was two days for the district. Under Senate Bill 25, we will have 10 days on a school by school basis. So they could be 10, school, 10 days over here, 10 days over here. They could overlap, but it's still going to be 10 days per school, uh, which is some added flexibility. Um, however, um, we are still limited by state statute to 10 NTI days for the district. And as Dr. Moore mentioned, we are using four of those this week. Um, and so we will have six NTI days left. Uh, we do not anticipate, although we are you know, hopeful, uh, that in the House, um, that bill will be amended to include more NTI days, um, because frankly, we would rather have the flexibility to have those extra days and not use them, not need to use them, rather than need to use them and not have them. Um, so that's where we currently stand. However, um, the, as I said before, the legislative session will last until April 15th. So as uh, things continue and as uh, the semester wears on, the legislative session wears on, depending on how bad the weather is, how bad uh, Omicron is, or whatever other variants may come down the pike, um, the legislature will have that flexibility going forward. They could uh, very quickly pass uh, more days as may be necessary. Um, another piece of legislation uh, that has been very prominent that has already passed the Senate and is headed to the House is Senate Bill 1, which deals with the responsibilities of your uh, site-based councils and school councils. Um, there are two major provisions to this bill. Um, the first deals with principal hiring, and that will really have no practical effect on JCPS because it really shifts um, all the other 170 districts throughout the state to more toward a JCPS model. It's not exactly uh, what's in statute for JCPS right now, uh, but it doesn't fundamentally change the way we do things. Um, under 
Senate Bill 1, the superintendent would have the absolute uh, authority to uh, hire principals. Um, they would have to consult with the uh, site-based council, uh, but consultation is not defined in statute, so that could be subject to um, district board policy. Uh, but uh, we do not anticipate at this time that, that would change JCPS's method of selecting uh, principals in a meaningful way. Um, Dr. Polio already um, works with site-based councils uh, in the current process. Uh, the second part of uh, Senate Bill 1 affects curriculum decisions and textbooks and other instructional material decisions. Those are currently at the site-based council level. Uh, those will be moved under Senate Bill 1 to the superintendent. Again, in consultation with the principal of the school, with the site-based council, and with stakeholders. Um, and, and again, this is a, a positive move, we think, for JCPS. Uh, it does allow flexibility um, for Dr. Polio and, and superintendents in any district um, to give flexibility to, it doesn't require every elementary school and district to have the same curriculum or the same textbooks, uh, but it does allow for consistency uh, at the discretion of uh, the superintendent in consultation with those school uh, officials. Um, and finally, uh, the state budget. I know I've, I've sent you an update already on um, this earlier this week, the governor announced uh, his proposal. We have not seen an actual bill yet. That should be uh, rolled out uh, probably early next week is when it will be filed. Uh, in addition, the House, in a very unusual move, um, filed House Bill 1, its budget proposal, or at least its initial budget proposal um, on Friday, this past Friday. Um, that has never happened in the recollection of anybody that I know uh, in the legislature. Um, Traditionally, the House waits for the governor to make his recommendation and then they get to work, um, but that is not required in statute for them to wait, so they went ahead and rolled out um, some proposals there. I will say that both the proposals that we have seen, and again, we, we have a written bill from the House, we only have the governor's outline that he has uh, introduced and rolled out in public, um, are both very good for education. I think it shows, uh, both of them show serious consideration for uh, the rainy day fund that we have, the budget reserve trust fund in the state, the budget surplus, and how we need to invest in human capital and in our schools. Um, there are some substantial differences between the two uh, bills, um, which uh, I'm happy to discuss at any point if you'd like. Uh, but that's sort of the update as of the moment, and I will turn it back to Dr. Polio. Well, thank you. As I conclude, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Thank you to everybody. Um, First of all, as we look at NTI days, you know, I want to say the decision, you know, we really went last week trying to get to school every single day that we possibly could, knowing that we only have 10 NTI days for the entire month of January and whatever comes after January. Um, but we also know it's putting such a stress on our schools. You know, when you have 1,100 teacher absences and really only three to 400 subs on a given day, that automatically means you're gonna have six, seven, 800 uncovered classrooms. Schools are being creative, they're being innovative and doing everything they can. Um, I wanna thank our central office staff who are going to schools to cover. You know, I mean, the, the way they've stepped up as a team, whether that be resource teachers, you know, we've even seen assistant superintendent stepping into school, into classes. I saw Michelle Dillard in a class, things like that are just, you know, that's everyone pitching in, but it is, become so challenging when there are so many absences. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we have to monitor it through the weekend this weekend. And, you know, I know our team spent a lot of time together this weekend trying to make tough, difficult decisions, but we obviously have to do what's right for our kids and our schools and the best instruction we can possibly have. I'll say this, I wanna be clear about this. You know, we have 10 NTI days. I think the remote days can help, but that is going to be difficult to pick which schools stay open, you know, and which don't when we are looking at it holistically as an entire district. You know, I would once again say, as I said yesterday, you know, I would propose that once we use our 10 NTI days that we could, you know, transition those other 10 into NTI days as well. I don't think anyone here wants unlimited NTI days but we do want to have the flexibility to support our schools and kids when they need that. So I'll reiterate and be clear about what I think the need for that is. And, and 
frankly, we don't have any idea what's coming after Omicron. So um, I think this is going to continue to be a problem throughout the state. Um, you know, I'm talking to other superintendents who are struggling on a daily basis to keep schools open as well. So, you know, that's um, how we're kind of making those decisions. We'll continue to move forward, but we know it's not going to be easy. I'll say this with the new guidance that came out from the CDC and the state health department. You know, we were not expecting that guidance to be like it was. That was a more dramatic change than expected. We say we're having to review it because it will require new procedures, new, new ways we do things that have not been done in the past. So I know people are anxious to loosen up. You know, some of the things we have this week to review we want to make sure we make the right decision as well, and we can implement anything uh, that is in, in those recommendations. So it is going to be some time for us to look at that, talk to local health experts um, before we come back to you and say exactly any changes we think should be made to that. So uh, we appreciate um, everyone's hard work on this. We really do. It's been very difficult and challenging. But we're going to continue to push through as we've done from the beginning of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Um, I will go through the list for board member comments or questions. Uh, this is our last information item and we will move from here to the consent calendar. So starting up uh, with board member McIntosh, please. And then Dr. Shul after that, if you have any questions or comments or if you have None, just let us know what your thoughts are, please. The only thing that I'll pass on um, related to our, our COVID mitigations and, and so forth, depending on, on folks' uh, perspectives, I've received either complaints, concerns, um, inquiries, around some of our events. I think the LIT is still happening, uh, various other indoor sporting or activity events where it seems um, we have large numbers of students participating who are not necessarily masked or following other protocols. Um, I know it's a lot harder to enforce, you know, parents or other um, audience members or crowds, but um, I just wanted to share that. I don't necessarily have a solution at this time, but I just want to um, make district personnel aware that I am, again, receiving a lot of um, communication from community members and parents that, again, depending on how they feel about the entire situation, it kind of frames um, what they're saying about it but just that there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of feedback around lack of protocols happening at a lot of our events. And I'll just leave it there for tonight because um, everything else is either minor or I can follow up with emails. Yeah, we are obviously reiterating that. I can say that's a major challenge, um, especially when you're talking about events that people outside of JCPS may be coming to as well, especially when no other entity at this time seems to be enforcing any of the mitigation efforts like we are forced to. But I can assure you that Robert and his team are working to tighten up those uh, mitigation efforts at those events. Is that all, Board Member McIntosh? Yes, that's all I had, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Chair Porter. Um, I wanted just to understand where we are on the Elevate Hubs. I know that uh, I believe it was the July 27th uh, board meeting. Uh, the board approved using the ESSA funds to open uh, hubs to kind of help to close the achievement gap and to work on um, remediation throughout the district. Um, we had hoped that those, uh, that, that the Elevate Hubs would be open by October. Uh, it's January and I was just curious where, where we are uh, in, in, as it relates to uh, opening those to children in this district. Yes, sir. Our first one, as I said, was in West Louisville. We're struggling. We have struggled to finalize the lease agreement um, and to get through all the hoops we've had to jump through. Um, 
to get that lease, but as soon as we get that lease finalized, um, we will be opening as quickly as we possibly can. So Dr. Averett's been working on it tirelessly. I know that she has a great plan put in place. Um, so as soon as we get the facility um, and all of the things we have to do to make it student friendly, so to speak, you know, the requirements we have to be up to code, we'll, we'll open as quickly as we possibly can. What is the holdup on the lease? Well, I think there were some some ownership issues with uh, who had ownership and then some discussions about in order to get the facility up to the code that we needed to have up, you know, who is responsible for those and whether KDE allows those things to be in the lease or not. Uh, those were some of the issues that we've been working through. Okay. Um, I, I are we providing enough support for the implementation of those hubs? I mean, what can we do to clear the way for uh, the implementation of those hubs so that they will not be further delayed? Well, I think all we've got to do is get is just get through this process of, of getting the lease to the building and then we will be ready to go from there. So I don't know if there's a shortcut to that. Um, unfortunately, I like to think we're going to move quicker sometimes than we actually do. Um, but it's it's getting through that process. I don't know if our general counsel wants to update any on that or not. Um, yes, and Dr. Polio, you're correct. Um, also, the lease has to be approved by the Kentucky Department of Education. Uh, we've been in current negotiations with the um, landowner or the building owner, and there's there's two parties involved. There's one that operates the space, and there's another that owns the building. And then there's gonna be a transfer of that property later on, which makes the lease very complicated. And we're also uh, prohibited by the state constitution from spending money on lease property to improve the real property. And so there has to be a negotiation between the landlord and the tenant, us being the tenant, as to what the landlord has to pay for to bring the building up to uh, be used as an educational facility and then what we pay for as far as like bringing in cubicles and things like that that's permitted under the constitution the department of education looks at all that and they will not sign off on a lease where those things are not clearly delineated um, and so <clears throat> the landlord dealing with the school district as a tenant is much more complicated uh, than dealing with other uh, tenants because of the constitutional limits on the use of the school fund. Was this the only available building in all of West Louisville? I think we looked at multiple buildings, but we felt this was this was the best one for what we were looking to do. Is there a timeline on being able to open this hub? Yes. Yeah, uh, we're uh, hopefully early spring, mid to uh, early to mid spring. Uh, the, the landlord or the owner of the building and the current operator of, of the programs that are in the rest of the building, they're engaging now in the, what we call the fit up of the building. That's putting in the walls, running wires, that those are permanent improvements to the building uh, that they have to perform before we can take ownership. And so they're in the beginning of that process. We actually had a call this week and our outside real estate councils in uh, contact with representatives from both of those parties as, are, as recently as today, I believe. Okay, well, um, we're, we're trusting you all. We're very confident in your abilities to make this happen. Uh, we need to have this hub opened in West Louisville. And as soon as we get that one open in West Louisville, District 6 is waiting uh, for one to be opened in Newburgh. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Duncan and uh, Board Member Marshall, please. Questions or comments? Okay, just want to express my <clears throat> appreciation for all the work that was done to prepare students for this shift into NTI. Uh, last week, I knew the kids were talking about it and were taking, um, and mine were taking their Chromebooks home and, and they were they were preparing for that. And I, I appreciate the, all of the planning that went on uh, to get ready for that. I know it had to happen. Um, question about the, the ECE support. Um, are we doing anything special for ECE support right now? 
or is this too short a time to, um, you know, we're looking at this school, we're going back on the 18th, is it too short a time to put things into place uh, that we'd had before? Uh, Ms. Chevalier. Uh, yes, ma'am. No, we have been preparing uh, for this as Dr. Polio has directed us to. And today, um, this afternoon, well, by early this morning, actually, we had delivered some technology such as Braille machines, et cetera, to some of our kids. So all technology specific to students has been delivered. Um, they have been prepping. They've been taking things home back and forth. And we updated uh, we use the same type of format that we've used for NTI in the past for all schools, teachers. We've updated all our resources. So it looks very similar. It's about a 30 page document um, that gives compliance, teaching resources, et cetera. So that's all been sent to teachers and, and staff. And we've talked with implementation coaches to see if there's any other needs. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Just one other question about the teachers. Uh, you know, the, the law is requiring them to be at school. Uh, what are we, what happens when teachers are in quarantine? Uh, how are we, how are we handling that? Our, our teachers who are quarantined are able to do that from home as they have been able to prior to NTI. So that is still in place and they are conducting class via NTI from home. Well, was that uh, provided for in that law? I mean, was there a, a special thing that said it would be okay for them to be at home? Uh, the requirement to be at school was so um, firm. I, I just wonder, did they have that flexibility written in there or are we just uh, assuming that? The telecommuting as we have it has been allowed for our teachers um, who are quarantining that was put in place very early on. And so we are continuing that um, allowance. Prior to a sub would be in the classroom with that teacher's students. Um, during NTI, there's no need for the sub in that particular classroom so that teacher can continue on. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, that's it. And just to add to that, um, Member Duncan, there was a carve out in that legislation that if a, a teacher is in quarantine, they can teach uh, remotely. They only, if they weren't in quarantine, then they had to be at their workstation. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duncan. Uh, Board Member Marshall. Thank you, Chair Porter. Thank you, everyone, for such your hard, you know, uh, everyone's hard work in regards to this. Uh, I did know what you said, Dr. Polio, just to think this is two years into this. You know, I thought we'd be back to business and uh, moving forward in other ways, but here we are. And so I just appreciate everybody doing the best they can with what we have available and doing everything in our power to keep all of our children and all of our staff, teachers, and everyone safe. So thank everybody for your work on this. I know there's a lot of people that can nitpick and find a lot of things that we can, you know, be upset about or ask more of, but... I believe everybody is, you know, working to the point of sheer exhaustion over all of this. So thank you for that. Um, and let's continue, you know, to do what is necessary. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Board Member Marshall, um, Board Member Craig, and then Dr. Chris. I'll echo Mr. Marshall's comments. I mean, safety has to be first. Um, period, new paragraph. Uh, we can't uh, reach our student achievement goals in the district without having students in the classroom. Uh, and NTI is wonderful. I know everybody's working really hard on it, but um, you have impressed upon this board since I joined it in January of 2019 that the best indication of student achievement was attendance days and that it started to precipitously fall off after day six. And we're losing those days now that we're back in NTI and it's going to have an impact now on the third academic year. So uh, setting up my question about the use of the 10 days and our legislative request for 10 more days, as it stands right now, we have 20, right? We have the 10 that was granted to us in the special session last year. Um, and then, uh, well, the potential in, I believe, Senate Bill 25 for an additional 
10, is that right? We have 10 right now. If Senate Bill 25 were to be approved, we would have 10 remote days, which are different than NTI days, but we would have 10 additional remote days the per remote school. Day, and I'm sorry, you discussed it a little earlier and I'm dense and I apologize for that. How are remote days different than NTI days? Remote days cannot be used for the whole district. It can be used for either uh, targeted schools who may have an issue. Right. There's a certain number of schools or grades or classrooms, um, which that part of it, I don't think is feasible for us, but uh, we could, we just can't use them for the whole district. So if we have enough people to staff Phoenix, but not enough to staff Crosby with the remote days, we could send Crosby into NTI and Phoenix could be in person. That is correct. That's what a remote. So we would that would count as if sent if this Senate bill passes, that would count as one day for Phoenix, and they would have nine more that we could use after that. I really am concerned, though, about um, the school by school, as you can imagine, the the watching that may go on and how we monitor which schools you know have people out, which don't, which when it happens early in the morning. You know, we get a lot of people to call in early in the morning. Um, you know, the just the logistics around that are very challenging. Um, and I trust you, you are the operations guy. It seems to me that 